advised that the meeting of the committee will be streamed live to the City of Adelaide website and a recording will be also published uh, to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of, of this meeting. This means that the presence, that your presence and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the Council, including transferring outside of Australia. Council acknowledges that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of Adelaide Plains and pays respect to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And we also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations who are present today. I believe we have apologies from Councillor Mackey and also from Councillor Kira. Have that noted? Yeah. Okay, I'm now um, seeking a mover and a seconder for uh, confirmation of the minutes of the committee held on the 16th of March and the special meeting of the committee held on the 23rd of March be taken as read and confirmed as an accurate recording of the proceedings. Councillor Connell, seconder. Councillor Hyde. Would you like to speak? Uh, would you like to uh, speak to it, Councillor Hyde? No? Um, those, take it to a vote, those in favour? Those, uh, are you both voting, Councillor Moran? Yes, we're doing it too. Oh, I wasn't getting that. Those in favour? Those against? Questions carried. Uh, we have no presentations today. We go to item. Um, to item 5.1 for the uh, a draft homelessness, social and affordable housing policy. Michelle, presenting, would you like to? <laughs> you might like to uh, start the uh, start on this item. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, so um, the report that you've got in front of you um, has been prepared in response to a resolution of Council in um, October 2019 to prepare a policy on social and affordable housing um, following the delivery of the State Government's housing strategy. So um, you recall last year in October we um, asked, we held a committee um, workshop and we asked Council a number of questions and that is assisted to inform us um, for the policy, the draft policy that you see um, before you today. Um, so we've incorporated homelessness, social and affordable housing. Um, and probably of note, the important thing is that um, the policy does propose a new project, which is the development of a local housing plan, which is in accordance with the expectations of the state government um, under their strategy. Um, and it also notes the proposed um, home buyers rate remission scheme will come to council in um, May. And importantly, that scheme is proposed to be tailored to low to moderate homes. So, just any questions? So just remember, um, councillors, we are um, asking for any questions um, in regards to the items. So if you um, would like to uh, have anything from Cheryl in regards to item 5.1. Mm -hmm. Councillor Martin. Mm -hmm. um, yes, um, look, the document says at page 12 that the City of Adelaide does not have a role in the provision of direct delivery, that is, of homelessness services, crisis accommodation, uh, and things of that nature. Is that true? Is that, is that our position? Page 12. So, when, so through the chair, when we're talking about um, homeless service provisions, we, we don't actually provide um, a direct service in terms of providing housing for homeless, but we do provide a coordination role. We have obviously been um, involved um, through the Don Gaston Foundation with the um, uh, Zero project as well. So not, not, we don't directly provide a role. Okay. Um, and so that means that the role that we have provided, which isn't mentioned here, which is providing crisis accommodation during periods of extreme heat or cold, such as opening up the bus station or opening up other buildings to accommodate homeless and other people, doesn't apply anymore. Um, um, through the chair, Councillor Martin, yes, I can see how we should answer that. That's crisis accommodation. 
Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Martin. Um, a couple of years ago, um, that option was removed. So during code blue, code red. So in uh, during periods of extreme weather, the options of council opening up its own uh, facilities was removed at the request of um, the, the group that oversees the coordinated service delivery approach. Um, and we did communicate that um, at the time. So um, the state government now directly funds other services to um, pick up that option. So for example, they fund the Hutt Street Centre to open the doors and allow people uh, to sleep there. Okay, so no role at all in, in the future, or, or in, if through the chair, the social housing as well, none in that, um, or affordable housing, no direct role. That's... I can see, uh, would you like to add to that? Uh, sorry, we do still provide quick response grants so, um, if people do, if agencies do require um, up to $2,000 to provide um, help and support that way, Councillor. That's two, up to $2,000? Quick response grants. Okay, well, I'm sure um, that would be appreciated, although it's not a great contribution. Um, um, sorry, in relation to the social and affordable housing, you have two parts to the. Well, we're talking about crisis accommodation. Firstly, and then you're talking about quick response grants in response to that as well, I'm assuming. So, if we don't have a social housing problem, or policy rather, um, or, or it's not our, our role to provide that, then um, how many social housing houses do we have at the moment? For you, presiding member, as the councillor would be aware, councillor in the past has been engaged in regards to affordable housing product. Ergo, being an example, with more square being another example, Sydney yeah. Place. Um, so, that, uh, but in regards to social, we have very limited interaction. We do work with CHPs in regards to various sites. But we have very limited interaction across the social normal stairs with the agency. Well, the, the social, social is defined in here as affordable as well. So, which, how many properties, which, where are you flipping it to? Over here, I'm not sure. Okay, all right. So, um, how many, Michelle? Through you, member, uh, as I indicated previously, we've got three sites which are affordable, and we've got three properties that uh, relate to a social housing product managed by CHPs. Um, but I'm happy to provide that after this meeting as an undertaking. Well, uh, no, I, my recollection is that you know that. Um, uh, we've discussed it before. Is it 50, 48? Are you presiding member in regards to affordable product? There's 50 residents um, mm -hmm. and they're split 12, uh, actually 12, 20 and 18 I believe in regards to the split, 12 being Sydney Place, uh, 20 being Whitmore and I think it's uh, 18 or 20 or whatever say 52 uh, within the Ergo apartments um, which was highlighted to council as part of the strategic property review. Okay, so if social housing is no longer a responsibility what will happen to all of these residents? Is it proposed in this policy that somehow we no longer support them? We, it's not part of our policy anymore. Tom? I'm trying to understand. Tom? To you, presiding member, again, just to, to come back to the presentations that have been done with strategic property reviews. And I think there was also questions during the COVID period in regards to tenants in affordable housing. Um, we have an obligation under current leases in yep. regards to affordable. However, once NRAS drops away, uh, the reality is that and there's always been the thought process that the council would sell down on that stock. Uh, and that was presented to council on uh, numerous occasions. Um, sorry, could you say that again? Are you saying that council will sell down? Is that what you said? Through you, presiding member, what, what I said was the affordable housing product is linked to the NRAS product. The NRAS product and two of those affordable housing projects are not, no longer there. There's one that remains within Ergo, and as council is aware, we would bring back adverse uh, times in regards to properties once we've left the NRAS scheme. 
as previously advised, we were dur during COVID, we weren't able to do anything because we're actually mandated to take care of the tenants currently within the facilities. Um, and then we would, and I'm trying to understand, you did say so that potentially. The your presiding member, that's indeed correct, but that would be subject to council's decision. Okay. Um, at uh, page 13 at the bottom, um, it says um, that we will facilitate the delivery of affordable housing as part of this policy via development agreements with private sector um, um, with mixed use developments where applicable. Now, um, I, I'm just wondering how that works because, um, as the chair would be aware, uh, SCAP was scathing in its uh, criticism of the city um, not providing, as it was required, affordable housing within a development. Um, in fact, it believed that uh, we hadn't met the criteria. And I know Council responded it had, but um, how will we do that? Will, uh, will it be um, uh, to the satisfaction of organisations like SCAP as it hasn't been in the past, or will it be the satisfaction of government, or I mean, how will we do that? See ya. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just to be just to be clear um, on the response to SCAP, we did receive correspondence afterwards um, to uh, say that um, they had um, not, I think it was not received the right amount of information to enable um, an informed uh, feedback on that component. So that was corrected afterwards. And um, Tom, would you like to add to that? Through you, presiding member, thank you, Acting CEO. Uh, certainly, through the uh, housing SA, the, uh, they clearly didn't understand the intent of what was under contract. And there is a commitment and a contractual commitment in regards to 15% affordable housing and all our projects that council are undertaking. And if we, and that's good news that uh, the SCAP recant, that's good. Um, uh, it, yeah, it would have been nice. Um, if we do provide and insist on providing affordable housing as part of developments in which we're involved or advocate for, is that, and it doesn't make clear in this policy, is that to be with conditions such as only for 90 days, only for 60 days, or will it be a straight out commitment that we will provide affordable housing at 15% for all time until it's taken up? Yep, I'm happy to So, um, as members are aware, um, there's a 30 day requirement, um, and for council projects, we typically take a, a 90 day approach to allow longer for these um, properties to be on the market. If you wish to strengthen the policy by making it clear, the council's approach um, will uh, commit to 90 days, and I think that would be appropriate for council. Well, as an amendment, you're I'm just saying if you wish to strengthen the policy in that regard. So that uh, whenever we become involved in projects, either as an approver or as a developer, we insist that affordable housing is made available for 90 days only, and after that goes to the general property market. That's what it is yes. now. Yeah, yeah. Plan. yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's good. That's good. Yeah, just, yeah. just for clarity, um, it is important to note that the uh, state government through Housing SA, the, the current criteria and conditions is 30 days to market. What we have done is strengthened it by adding additional days and also working with the appropriate agencies and looking for potential rent or stroke buyers out there. So we're actually working above technically three times the amount of time spent in the affordable housing market to actually attract affordable housing. Is that, does, do we usually get 100%? How, how much, is that successful? So to you, Chair. Through you, presiding member, uh, the, the question would be, Councillor, is that uh, once NRAS has moved out, 
and there's no subsidy and whatever that that's a struggle for a lot of developers to actually achieve that the the threshold for affordable housing product you're talking around 417 416,000 for an apartment the build cost isn't much less for that however we have stipulated in our contracts that this needs to be achieved and we could extend the timelines on that and both developers are working towards that and working with government agencies but what I mean is, sorry, it's really uh, what I mean is, when given that extra time, are they taken up or the most lapsed into the non affordable housing? <clears throat> Through you, presiding member, yeah. this is the first time where we've actually enforced oh, a so negative day, yeah. day limit uh, above and beyond what is stipulated for the intention of that they can actually because market to. Correct. Right. Yeah. Uh, I guess. Um, um, sorry, uh, Michelle, did you want to add something to that? Um, sorry, just to clarify that, if we just need to be really clear that our role as a regulator and as an owner are quite different. So, obviously, the developers. Um, we can't impose that 90 days on somebody else. That's something we can make a decision about ourselves, but we're not able to do that. Um, and, and Are you still going? Oh, yeah, I've got a couple more questions. Uh, um, can, can we take a read of two questions and ask one question at a time? Okay. Um, page 12 um, of attachment B uh, shows that housing stress in the city according to the administration of Sirius, there are 1,800 households um, experiencing the definition of household stress um, and uh, housing is unaffordable for anyone earning less than $65,000 a year. Now they're, they're pretty serious figures. How does this policy help them? Those people in housing stress? Um, so through the chair, you'll, you'll note the next that next sentence does does indicate that this trend in housing stress is not just for the city; it's actually the state and, and nationally. Um, so it, it is a, a trend we're seeing in terms of low to moderate income households. So the, the critical thing for the city of Adelaide is that the median house price and apartment price is um, significantly um, higher than in other um, lower. Um, price bracket suburbs. So it is a challenge. The way that we go, uh, the way that this policy goes towards that is obviously advocating um, to state government and to the federal government in terms of what their role is in social and affordable housing. Um, we also provide support in terms of social and affordable housing to community housing providers by providing 100% rate rebates, and that's proposed to continue as well. Um, I, I guess the really important thing is this policy really clearly aligns to what the role of local, state and federal government are in terms of the responsibility for housing. Chair, can, uh, can I ask whether it's a fair summation to say that our policy, apart from contributing $32,000 in partnership with the state government to develop a local housing plan, apart from continuing what we've always done and giving rate remissions, um, to organisations involved in providing services for the homeless, uh, putting to one side any rate for emission scheme which has not been approved, um, our role is pretty much advocate. There's no support, basically. Would, would that be a fair summation in the administration? Oh, a CEO, would you like to answer that one? Because I think it's pretty clear in the papers that that's what it says, um, and it's pretty clear that what our role is as um, to the rate for the rate acting on behalf of the ratepayers. I think it's pretty clear in the papers what our role is as a city council. Um, no, I mean, it says in the papers. If you, I'm sure that you've read them thoroughly. As no, no, no. I, I do. I'm just. Uh, and it says in there we advocate and we work with uh, certain organisations and um, we fund certain, certain organisations, work with them, and uh, and that's what our role is as the city of Adelaide. I, I guess the question I'm asking is, is this a diminished role for the city? I don't, I don't think it's a diminished role, Councillor Martin. I think it's a, a role that we work side by side in ensuring that we um, offer services to... Uh, oh, okay. Sorry, Michelle, would you like no, to... No, 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 you keep going for it. Oh, sorry, thank you, thank you. Sure. Yeah. No, sorry thank point, you. point of order, we're, we're actually debating the content now, Chair, and I think that's really inappropriate. I think we save that for Council. No, I, I actually questions. agree with you, Councillor Hyde. We are entering the debate, but in order to um, answer, 
finish this off, I would have Michelle um, elaborate further. Um, thank you, through the chair. Um, I would say that our policy that we have developed is consistent with the Australian Housing and Urban Research Institute in terms of what is what are the levers available to the various levels of government. So it talks about zoning laws and inclusionary zoning, and that is something that we are advocating strongly to the federal government on mandatory inclusionary zoning, um, planning um, permits and restrictions. Uh, it talks about our role in terms of the infrastructure provider, and then in terms of financial mechanisms, it talks about council rates. So what we're proposing is entirely consistent with that. However, we are actually taking a step further in terms of looking at our own assets as well. Thank you, Michelle. Councillor Moran? Well, from what I can read, it is diminished role, but could you um, please explain, did you, were you saying through your chair, um, Claire, about um, emergencies like heat waves and we, when it's a code, something or other, don't we offer that anymore? No. So that is a, a, a big diminution of our, of our service. Can I ask also why is this proposed? I think we need to elaborate on that, the CEO. I don't think you need to elaborate. No, on because you're making an assumption that there is no, further to that. Councillor Moran, no, the CEO will answer this question. Sorry, don't debate with me, Chair. The CEO is, I'm just telling you, Councillor Moran, I'm letting you know yeah, that the CEO will answer what you I don't need to speak to. She has answered my question, it's been asked and answered. We no longer offer emergency as the chair i am directing the ceo to elaborate I further I well i don't care what you want councillor moran that's what i'm doing thank you very much you don't care what CEO? i want I don't, I don't, it's been asked and answered councillor moran. Moran. moran i would just i am chairing chair this chair. meeting and the ceo why is going to speak further so in regards to this. your why statement that you just said right there. I Thank you very much. I don't care what you need. We are in a public forum. This is the city of Adelaide. This is where the great payers are wanting to hear in regards to this uh, particular item. And we would like to speak further on what you just claimed there. Thank I you. It's not for you personally. She has answered it. Could I ask you why I'm you having the CEO. Thank you. I'm having the CEO elaborate further in your comments. Well, it's form. not necessary. But well, well, they will. She will. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Councillor Moran, I will just say um, that we wouldn't consider providing uh, the bus station um, as a, a component of long-term um, addressing any uh, homelessness, social or affordable housing here in the city of Adelaide. And it was at the request of other services, but there are others better placed to deliver that in a safer way for those people that need to um, uh, partake of those services. Um, in relation to why this policy has taken time, um, it was really important that the uh, that Saha did their piece of work first. Um, that's been a piece of work that they have been progressing for the last couple of years as well. We've worked very closely with them to make sure um, that the data aligns, that the research aligns, that um, we're working in conjunction um, with the appropriate state government um, authorities uh, to enable our policy to best support delivery. So, so what you're saying, um, CEO, is that the state government and the agencies are slow because this is a very small report to have taken such a long time, but you're basically waiting for the agencies to do their stuff, is that what you're saying? There's been a massive reform piece happening, Councillor Moran, in state government in relation to housing policy. Um, and that's a really big piece of work, a really important piece of work. We've worked alongside the last couple of years um, with state government. I don't think they've been slow, so please don't um, spin words on my behalf. Thank you. No, 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 I'm saying, um, I'm I'm saying, saying it think... seems like they've been slow, because this, is, this was moved in uh, Council in October the 20. Second, 2019, and it really is just a few pages of um, basically not much change, really, except a few things excluded. So, so anyway, that's uh, that's, well, that, that's your yeah, observation. That's my thank you. You can enter that into the debate next that. week. Um, Councillor Hyde. Um, uh, look, there are a couple of things in there that I just wanted to ask about. First, regarding mandatory inclusionary zoning. Um, now that would be a planning, through your chair, that would be a planning mechanism. But and I notice it says to advocate to the federal government. Federal government has no jurisdiction in planning mechanisms. So what, what constitutionally is the basis for 
the city and other local government associations and housing uh, advocates to say that the federal government should weigh in on this because I actually, actually don't know if it's able to be done. What's the what's the rationale there? Um, so through the chair, so this is a piece of work that actually all of the capital cities are doing together in terms of having a national approach and a consistent approach um, to um, having mandatory inclusionary zoning. Because as we understand at the moment, under the state legislation and similar in other states, it, it isn't mandatory. Um, so it, it's having that consistent approach no matter where you are in terms of the country. Obviously, you're, you're correct in terms of what's the role of the federal government and what's the role of state government. So it's obviously taking that through the appropriate channels with both state and federal government to get that consistent approach. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that. And also, thank you for the report as well. As Since Robert's gone, no one actually said thank you for any work that's done. So thank you for that. Um, uh, I, job to thank. I would. I would, I would just say, um, uh, so we've, we've gone, we've, we've obviously defined our role pretty clearly, but we do also just have to be cognizant of other level of government um, sort of role. Um, regarding as well some things that um, aren't featuring in there, in our um, in our submission to the uh, Housing and Homelessness Strategy, I forget what it was actually called, I think it was called that, um, we spoke about a few things. Uh, one of them that comes to mind is built to rent, um, did we consider that as something, and I know it's being done quite successfully in Queensland, um, I think it's a pilot, it's like a $50 million pilot, but did we consider you know, out of the box ideas such as that? Um, yes, yeah, so through the chair, when we came to council with the workshop, we did give some examples in terms of what was occurring in other states. I think there was also built rent in Victoria, um, in, in Melbourne as well. So we did actually have a look at that and findings um, and how those things were progressing um, as well. Yeah, but when, sorry, I suppose through the chair, it's it's just that we've sort of picked and chosen some uh, schemes and ideas um, that may help. But what's the what's the rationale of picking NRAS, which has you know sort of been firmly ruled out by the current federal government? over something like build to rent, which is a new idea, I guess, is the question. Uh, Tom? To presiding member, I, I think probably the easiest way to talk to build a rent, and I think it was uh, Councillor Donovan who raised it in the board earlier sort of on the stage, is it, it's important to understand that we're actually working with our proponents at the minute in some of our developments and they're looking at models such as build to rent. Uh, the reality is, you know, everyone's looking to see how they make that 15% threshold without any funding that's coming through. Um, so build to rent now is probably more attractive than what it's ever been than, than, than actually owning a property. Um, look, everything hinges on funding. The reality is build to rent is probably easier to fill, to occupy than actually selling down because the reality is there is no end rats, there is no funding or whatever. Um, so they're looking at various models. Not easy. No, I understand that. Um, uh, the the other thing I'm I'm curious about. Uh, there are when we talk about advocating to other levels of government, there are a suite of measures that were brought in housing affordability package in 2017, um, and there just wasn't any reference to any of those in um, in the document. I'd be really curious to know whether the administration has any thoughts around. You know, the introduction of the managed investment trusts or the capital gains tax concessions um, and because we're, we're talking about facilitating and assisting how we can plug into some of those um, uh, some of those federal government policies and looking at the um, national housing finance and investment corporation and you know there's new partnership agreements national affordable housing agreement that was signed on that but there's no reference to any of that in there now i don't know those policies in huge detail um, but I would have liked a document like this to think about how we plug into those or encourage others to plug into those, I guess. Was any of that considered? See you. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, a lot of that was um, shared as part of the background work um, and through the workshop as well last year. Um, I think just to, be, just to be clear, this policy is basically um, trying to encapsulate what we would 
um, like to see. Obviously what we do with our own land holdings is subject to a different approach. So this is a, a policy to enable um, a consistent um, consistent approach with those developers in the city that do come and talk to us and the planning staff around where, what the approach that we'd like to take. And there's also a piece of work around um, residential growth that members will be aware that's been in train through uh, the Capital City Committee. And we'll be hoping to share some of that with members um, in the coming months. Um, I think there's sort of various other mechanisms to enable um, a whole diversity of um, approaches to be undertaken um, in relation to that piece of work as well. But this policy really is just trying to synthesise this council's position in relation to homelessness, social, affordable housing. Just, just one more regarding our, um, our actual position. Obviously, the only thing of any sort of great impact that's really in here that we can do is development on our own land. Um, obviously, 4.0 for affordable um, housing. But what it doesn't outline is is a, a line in the sand, I suppose, Chair, where, you know, state government has 15% affordable housing. We're going to say that we want 25% affordable housing. So I just, because effectively what, what this policy, in my view, is going to do is give our director of city shaping a direction to go um, and work with developers on our land when we have developments like Adia de Connell and Central Market Arcade to say you need to put more affordable housing into it but it doesn't actually say how much affordable housing into it and that's I suppose my concern is that is, is this policy giving administration carte blanche to say 50 percent affordable housing and in doing so reduce the rate of return to the rate payer because that is, in my view, against the principles of the strategic property review. So I just want to know, or is it all, is this just a guide, I guess? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so, so through the chair, I think um, when we're talking, if you look at um, part three, um, to your point there, um, in terms of our role, where we've got facilitated deliveries and community housing, um, by city of Adelaide on land subject, we've got subject to feasibility um, and then again in terms of um, fixed price housing so that would be affordable housing and again it's it's where we are actually divesting and it is subject to feasibility so of course any of those types of projects would come back into council for um, council's approval that wouldn't just go through because of that policy. I suppose it would have would it be the administration's view that they would present us with options around different mixes or I'm just trying to picture in my mind how it works in practice. Tom? Through you, presiding member, we present all options to council for consideration, but I think the realities are affordable housing at present is a, it, it's, it's an issue even for the state government in regards to how they achieve 15% thresholds. Um, if you are a developer, the, the reality is where's the carrot? We know where the stick is or where's the stick? We know where the carrot is. So the reality is how do you bring incentives in to actually achieve? Because the build cost versus how you qualify is very close. So the margins aren't significant for a developer. Mm. So I think there is a piece where you know, state government, um, stroke federal government need to look at the incentivizing things. Like that. Which if I may say was the key point about the 2017 housing affordability measures, they had capital gains tax, managed investment trust, all these various measures to incentivize the production of affordable housing in there, there were billions of dollars in there. That's why I would have liked that explored a little bit. But. Um, uh, the, the only last question I have is just to clear up uh, an untidy point in my mind. Is it, is it that uh, in order to qualify for affordable housing, you, it, it is, it is a, a fixed price or, or is it that you need to be selling at a fixed price to a certain type of person, uh, i.e. a low income earner? Is that, do you need both of those conditions in order yeah. to qualify? Yeah. Um, yes, so through the chair, there, there is an element in terms of what price is, mm -hmm. and then there's also an element in terms of the eligibility yeah. um, of someone, and it d differs for the same individual or family. Which is a, and you need to give it to them for a certain period of time. That's what That's I, correct. Okay. And then it, it obviously, the con sale, there's, there's other challenges as well. Yeah, and sorry, just one final point. Are we, 
are we going to be part of an alliance here in the city, like Homeless Alliance? What's the what's the go with those? So, so through the chair, we maybe we can talk about that in the next item. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Sure. Yeah. Can we just wrap up? We've spent 30 minutes on this item. Uh, just an important question. I mean, I think Councillor Hart raises a really but, but we're going to the next point where that, that's going to be discussed. No, so. no, I'm not. I, I want to revisit a point he's uh, raised because I think it's really important. All right. Sure. And, uh, you know, this is uh, the occasion to talk about this. And I, I thank Councillor Hart for that, uh, that thoughtful consideration. But I, I just wonder then if we're not stipulating, and I've got to say to you, I just read into this that we were agreeing to a 15%. Um, a component into the policy. If we have not done that, if Council Alliance interpretation and my understanding of that is correct, what, why wouldn't we do that? What are the considerations? Can you step me through that? So through the Chair, we haven't explicitly called it out because it is actually state government legislation, so we would comply with state government legislation. No, but we don't have to comply with state government legislation. We can we actually... do in terms of the process and, and we do undertake that. But as um, Tom had indicated earlier, we have increased that from 30 days to 90 days. It's what we can call that out more specifically, be explicit in that, but I've got a few more questions. No, 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 I, I get that. And, and I, I do understand that we do have capacity to vary our approach as we've done with 30 days, 60 days, 90 days or whatever. Can someone step me through why we wouldn't say 15%, why we would say 10% or 20 or 25 uh, rather than just be Tom, so, I think you might need to elaborate on that. Do you say, remember, it's a very good question. I think the reality is why not 17%, why not 20%? It's market driven. Uh, the realities are cost of build versus return. 15% um, for a lot of developers at the minute. Uh, Unless it, it's government driven, like ourselves or state government, we find it very hard to even meet that 15% threshold. And then naturally, 30 days elapses. We've, we've looked at the 15%. We're giving them the best opportunity. We're looking at their marketing collateral. We're introducing them to the right agencies and whatever. Developers quite simply will turn around and say the cost of build versus return. If you extend the days, we're sitting on money. Mm -hmm. As simple as that. We're sitting on money. And they probably wouldn't build. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I do understand that, I understand what you're saying, but we, when we're saying that, uh, and we have been in cases, why wouldn't we say in the policy, where it is our build, we will strive for, instead of nothing? Um, I, as I said earlier, Councillor Martin, there's um, absolutely, if you want to set some aspiration um, as part of this policy, then um, we look forward to those amendments next week. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to move on from um, this item and uh, go to item 5.2. Um, any questions in regards to this item? Michelle, you're still. Move on 5.2. Still staying in the chair. Thank you. Um, any questions? Councillor Martin? Um, look, I just. I just noticed, um, and look, I, I thank you for this. Uh, I think the um, uh, the way in which the money is proposed to be expended is great, um, but I have a, a question in relation to the ninety-five thousand dollars. Is that the correct amount? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Is all of that going on staff, or is it to go on some other things? Um, so, uh, so, so through the chair, that none of that goes on staff. That's uh, it's all. Oh, okay, okay, good. And so, what, what what's happening to the ninety-five thousand? Um, what, what 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 is it envisaged? It will be spent on. And through the chair, the um the report recommends the ninety-five thousand is used to partner with um, state government and other non-government services on some initiatives that we can implement uh, urgently in terms of the issue that we've currently got in the city. So um, there is some high level uh, task force groups that have been established with the state government uh, at the moment, and we want to be able to use that um, that funding to be able to flexibly partner with people on, some, uh, on any programs that are identified through that. So uh, um, if I can be more specific, does that mean, um, I'm not sure who's answering questions in the room, uh, does that mean we're talking about bus fares or Chartering buses and the like, or no, potentially. Yeah. 
Um, thank you through the chair. Um, that's something uh, we wouldn't be funding. That's already covered through state government and other agencies. Um, the Aboriginal uh, Mobility Data Report um, has a range of different actions. Um, as, as Lauren's indicated, a task force has been set up, which is all the relevant agencies um, across um, state government. Um, plus Port Adelaide Enfield Council, plus the City of Adelaide. Um, there's a whole raft of um, recommendations within in that. What we're proposing is that we divert some of that, um, that 95,000 to progress um, potential recommendations, but there's a piece of work to happen first, which is work with the relevant agencies to prioritise um, the projects within that, and then obviously we will bring that to back to council, not necessarily from Dawson, but certainly from Moti. We want to make sure that council members um, understood and have full visibility um, over where that 95,000 could potentially be spent. Okay, and uh, I note the administration uh, references at 16 that uh, when well, I'm assuming the Lord Mayor uh, was informed by this report when she received it she wrote to the premier um, and there was a task force formed as a consequence but uh, there's no copy of a letter is it possible for the administration to include that so we can just get a better picture yeah. um sorry there's a couple of microphones on uh, through the presiding member thank you for your question and um, that was correspondence from the law mayor direct to the premier um it's not for uh, public distribution well, oh, I'm happy for it to be distributed confidentially, that's fine. Um, my experience tells me that nothing that we've ever put on email in confidence ever is retained in confidence. Um, what I am happy to do is have a hard copy letter for you to peruse um, under the supervision of myself or someone else, Councillor. Well, we read about it on the paper. Yeah, yeah. So if somebody has given that letter to the advertiser, we haven't had it. Um, we're going to move on. Is there any further questions? No, 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 no further questions. Well, you got your answer to your question, Councillor. No, 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 but no. it is possible to have more than one question. I know that you're very brief, Chair. But well, I think we're going to move on. We can come back, though, Councillor Martin. So I'm just going to, Councillor um, Kira, uh, sorry, <laughs> Councillor Hyde would like to ask for permission. Yes, um, <laughs> uh, we can come back. Thank you. Um, I note in the report, and I'm just jumping around, sorry, uh, it, it said that um, talking to people with lived experience, they didn't like the idea of a hub. Um, but I understood that a hub or well, feasibility study, business cases, the hub was one of the first things we used that $200,000 to look into. I don't think it doesn't look like it's mentioned any further in here. Can we get an update on where that work got to? Yeah, through the chair, um, the, the first report that's in there, the, um, the feasibility study to service coordination. So that looked at, um, at a range of ways of providing better service coordination through um, homeless services in the city. And um, the hub, uh, a hub idea was one of those, um, one of those suggestions. The, um, the, uh, the feedback that came back through that is that a hub isn't something that, um, that service providers or people with experience of homelessness uh, would feel that they'd engage very well in because they want the opportunity of choice and being able to um, to go where they feel better supported. Um, so the report focuses on how uh, services can be better coordinated to better provide the needs of people um, without having to be co-located. The, um, also, the report, as the report mentions, the, the current reform in the homelessness sector um, will have a really big impact in how that coordination happens. So that, so that, sorry, that's what the ninety thousand dollars delivered is that that paper or yes, yes. So that was uh, forty five from uh, council and forty five from the housing authority. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Did um, and apologies if I missed it in there, but uh, I know it said the service providers didn't want to co-locate and the, the homeless people wanted to have choice. Um, noting that, of course, the entire point of this reform is to force service providers to uh, play fair with each other instead of having a disconnected, disjointed social services industry as a whole. Um, did, the, did it consider then that um, service delivery may be improved through a hub or like did it actually answer that question? I understand uh, people who are rough sleepers may not have liked the idea because you'd be saying, oh, this place that you usually go to for breakfast is closed 
and it's going to put, be put with this place where you know you don't usually go to so they might be unfamiliar with that I understand that that choice may not be ideal for them but i suppose the fundamental question was could services be delivered better through that did it answer that question uh, to the chair, the, um, I think really what it speaks to is the, the safety of individuals who are uh, attending um, these service providers. So, you know, people you know, like other people, members of the community, not everybody um, all wants to be in the same spot at the same time. So people, you know, do um, want to have that choice and, and they're supported through having choice through service providers. So even though the reform is um, aimed at getting service providers to be more coordinated, it's not necessarily around them being co-located, um, but how they can support each other to provide services. So it might be better referral systems between services rather than um, than actually being in the same location. Understood. Um, uh, I suppose just, just on that point, I read into it, Chair, that that was the issue with the bus station, just when you have a code blue or code whatever, lobbing all these homeless people who may have their own mental health issues and, and what have you would not be safe. Is that is that how I interpreted that? Which is not ideal to put them all in the one spot and say, oh, you're in an emergency situation, you'll go here. That's a, essentially the same same problem as a hub would produce if people don't. So through know. the chair, I can't answer in terms of the code you'll read about the report. It's clear that there are there are certainly individuals who uh, fall into the homelessness category who feel vulnerable if they have to come to the same location as everybody else because they are vulnerable themselves to perhaps behaviours that, that might be experienced in, in a in a co-location. Got you. I think I think that answers that question. Well. Um, uh, did you through the chair? Was there any work done on how much all the recommendations would cost to fund? Through the chair, no, if it, it, uh, it hasn't been identified in the report or in terms of that, um, how much it would cost to actually implement all of that. Um, I think really the intention of those um, recommendations is for um, once a new alliance such structure is, um, is up and running um, after the 1st of July, that they're things that alliances can consider in terms of being able to better coordinate themselves. Thank you. And through the chair, was it, I suppose, did the state government have any other? This ninety-five thousand I moved originally, you know, co-contribution dollar for dollar from them. Did they not come up with any other ideas that they wanted to fund? Uh, through the chair, uh, uh, basically, what uh, the state government has been focused on is their reform, um, and so that is how they are looking at re, you know, redistributing their funding. So that's really their priority. Um, so, so that's why we're coming back and asking that, that there is another option for us to be able to use that money. Okay, thank you. And finally, a dual leg uh, question. Um, uh, one, going back to the alliances, are we going to be part of an alliance or participating or do we just wait to see what the result of their cage match is and, and help whoever wins? Um, uh, and uh, two, has, has there been any interest from either competing alliance for our, I think we're, we're northern or southern, um, in, in these recommendations in this work? Has, has they picked it up and said, oh, this looks good, we, we'd we like to adopt this as part of our proposal? It's been any interest there. Um, thank you through the chair. So um, as, as members would be aware, um, the tender has yet to go out for these alliances. Um, and there is still ongoing conversation around um, how the city is um, not managed, but how the city then supports um, and has its, because it has its own unique issues, um, how we then come together with all the relevant agencies um, to help continue um, the strong coordination uh, work that's been underway over many years. Um, do you have an update, Lauren, in terms of time frames and whether there's been any further discussions around whether the city of Adelaide sits in the east or the west? Uh, yeah, through the chair. The, um, the city of Adelaide, uh, as a boundary, as a location, will sit within the Southern Alliance. Um, and the, um, uh, the uh, my understanding is that outcomes will be known uh, in the next month because they need to be uh, able to start the new uh, structure from the 1st of July. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Oh, good. Thank you. Um, look, one of the things that was touched on there is, uh, and it's good that the report is 
a thorough in, in terms of its recommendations, but uh, it goes a step further and allocates tasks to particular entities, which is great, um, including the City of Adelaide, and we've talked about one of them. And one of the others is that the report identifies that um, the parklands are used no matter what by Indigenous people or uh, Aboriginal people, as they're described in the report, as a, a base for sexual contact, for sleeping, uh, eating, whatever it is and that we need to recognise that and that the City of Adelaide is charged with improving the amenity of the parklands to facilitate that. So what does that look like? Yeah. Uh, thank you, through the Chair. That's a, that's a really good question. I think what this piece of work um, certainly has helped me understand is that um, by overlaying that cultural framework across the parklands, you actually start to need to see um, the, the use of uh, the parklands, particularly around Aboriginal mobility, quite differently. Um, a lot of this work is still quite early days. Um, there have been some various suggestions uh, just around making sure um, that where people um, are camping, that there's some more, um, that we, you know, there could be an opportunity to pilot um, different types of uh, support in relation to running water or to cleansing those types of activities. But we need to work through this. We need to work through it with Ghana as well. That's an important consideration. Um, and we also need to link into the work that the state government's leading around um, mobility from areas um, from the Northern Territory as well. So there's various pieces of work that are currently underway. Um, but the, I think what this project has done is um, certainly um, helped overlay a cultural lens across the use of those parklands and why people are where they are. I get that. So what you're saying to me is it's a work in progress. And that's okay. Um, and I guess, and Dr. Thomas makes the point very strongly at page 19, that this is um, a Ghana issue as well, because it's Ghana planet. We're talking about the way in which Ghana land is used. Um, uh, can I ask what the response of the Reconciliation Committee has been both to the report and the consideration of our responses? Uh, the, the Reconciliation Committee was involved in early um, consultation of the report. So um, when the um, Australian Alliance for Social Enterprise embarked on it, they came and spoke to the Reconciliation Committee and got, um, and got some advice from them uh, into that. And, um, and they have, um, I'm saying that trying to think of if we, they have received the report as well, but we haven't had a committee meeting since it's been closed. So they're not aware of our role in terms of providing staff, in terms of providing money, uh, our, our involvement in terms of our plans and so on. They just haven't been involved. No, no, I mean, they subsequent to the report. They've got a copy of the report. We've not had a discussion with them to the extent that we're having now. The, um, no, because we haven't had a meeting with the, so this, this is just coming to council now as yep. a, a round out from the funding that was provided by council for this. Um, we've certainly had con uh, discussions with the reconciliation committee um, over the last few months in relation to the development of the stretch map in terms of some of these, um, these are, uh, items as well. Oh, the crossovers from the stretch map to this. Okay. Uh, sorry, thank you, Chair. I was just going to um, comment that we've actually met on several occasions now with not only members of the Reconciliation Committee but also the wider Aboriginal community to talk through a lot of these and in particular uh, the meeting that we had uh, on the it was last week wasn't it with the Reconciliation Committee uh, talking through the stretch wrap uh, was very much a discussion around Aboriginal mobility and what is needed and particular emphasis on uh, parklands and also uh, the respect for um, visitors to Ghana land and how we might better facilitate that through collaboration. Thank you. I think I'm going to move on now. 5.3. Yep. Thank you. So uh, 5.3, we have a uh, variation of the encroachment policy with Stephen Smuski. Oh, no, we don't. <laughs> 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 
It's my no, baby I'm tonight. Me. We've got Helen and Lisa. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Any questions? No? We're all good? No questions? Thank you. Well, I think we'll move on. That was easy. You can move on to 5.4. So you're staying on for that one as well? Uh, the way of land management agreement. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, we're on 5.4. No questions? We can move on then if there's no questions. Uh, we can go to 5.5. So we do have Christy for this one. <laughs> Thanks, Christy. Thank you. So this is for the proposal of the Adelaide Cabarets Festival for the Spiegel Tent. So any questions in regards to this item? Councillor Martin? Um, yeah, look, I do, I do have a couple of uh, questions in relation to, uh, and I should preface this by saying that um, it is um, slap bang in the middle of North Adelaide, so uh, you'd understand there's some sensitivity about it. We're, we're proposing to allow um, this event to operate on Friday nights until 3 a.m., Saturday nights until 3 a.m. Um, I just wonder, does the A-Plan actually agree to 3 a.m. closures? For um, Friday and Saturday night, I think uh, it was. I think we've got Tom who's going to answer that one. Thank you, Chair. Yeah. Could I just um, acknowledge that I've got a conflict of interest as I'm on the board of the Adelaide Festival Centre Trust? Yeah. But given us it's a, not a decision given making. It's not decision making. That's right. Start. Yeah, that's absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tom. Through your presiding member, in response to Councillor Martin's question, the plan uh, allows operation up until 3 a.m. on Friday and Saturday night with Council approval. Um, not sure that's approval for anything past midnight. The only one of relevance to this would be a Thursday, which is at odds because it says midnight on Thursday within the current plan. Okay, so it, um, the A plan is actually midnight, and we're proposing by council approval to move at 3 a.m. So, what do you say? Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. No, the, it is in line with the Adelaide Parklands Events Management Plan. It's because it's a new event going past midnight. That was the requirement that that then came to council for consideration. And as Tom's just indicated, the only evening that uh, the customer is requesting that's not in line with the Adelaide Parklands Event Management Plan is the Thursday evening. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to be thick about this, but uh, you were saying to me that there are restrictions or rules in related to operation of events into the early hours of the morning, but it does not apply to new events unless approved by council. Is that correct? Uh, Do you want to explain that again, Sia? Yes. So what the Adelaide Parklands Events Management Plan does is give operating hours for use of all the spaces and parks and squares across the city. Um, and um, what, um, when that was reviewed, um, what council was uh, considering at the time was um, not impacting those events that had long-term up to five year agreements in spaces because obviously a policy shift would then impact their ability uh, potentially to operate and why they had undertaken a five-year land use agreement with us. So the request sorry, was if there's a... Sorry, in the background. Could you speak with that? Sorry. Councillor Hyde? Sorry. Sorry, sorry. So the request was for any new event that was to take place in the parklands, council approval, um, to, and were requesting to operate after midnight, even though they, the um, plan allows them to operate after midnight, is to be brought into council for consideration. Okay, so what does the A plan allow existing organisations, not new organisations, to trade to on a Friday night? 3 a.m. The A plan says that? Yes. yes.
Even though it's got a children's hospital right next door, I'm um, so obviously um, this is managed in conjunction with our noise mitigation as well, so and noise management plans. But if you face, you know, through your chair, if you face the speakers one way, you hit the Royal Adelaide Hospital, you hit face them the other way, you hit the Ribbons and Children's Hospital, you face them the other day, you hit the other way, you go straight up the river valley to North Adelaide. I, I'm, I'm gobsmacked that we're, that 3 o'clock is ever, I don't think I've ever heard of an event. I mean, yeah. that's the street where we were with the uh, Royal Croquet Club. And, and I'd like to... Thank you. Well, Royal Croquet Club is in Victoria Square, which has a midnight um, cut-off. Um, so... But it did operate in that area, though. Sorry? It did operate in that area. Yeah. Yeah. On the river, yeah. Pinky Flat. At Pinky Flat, yeah. yes, which was 3 a.m. Yeah. as well. Um, so what we, um, when we underdid, um, I think it was at the request of you, Councillor Martin, through a motion and review of our noise mitigation, we learned an awful lot around the placement of speakers. Um, and so as part of um, any um, engagement with a new event, um, we have a lot of information and obviously we build that in, into the um, licence requirements um, and make sure that people understand the best place for noise to be emitted to minimise the impact, particularly on North Adelaide through that River Bank precinct. Sorry, Christy, you have to add something? If I might, thank you. Through the chair, I just got to point out that this is in a Spiegel tent in a yeah. in a covered venue. Yeah. It's for 350 people and it's happened the previous year with no complaints whatsoever. To 3 a.m. Yeah. To 3 a.m. So there's no, it's it's not the first no, no, there's no, no noise no. mitigation policy. So that's absolutely that. ensure that we um, we don't have spill that you will hear in North Adelaide. It's had it's operated in those hours previously. Thank you. Thank you. I was going to interject on that one. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? We're all good and cleared that one up. Okay. Just, just one more question. If it wasn't in a speaking event, if it was a um, you know, outside venue speakers point in which you're as I've just pointed out, it doesn't matter where you point your speakers, you're gonna you're in trouble. Would that still be a three o'clock close? Yeah. Well that's something I think we need to look at in the future. It's not acceptable. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. Um, now, item 5.6. Now, I've got uh, Matthew down as presenting for this item. Yeah, you're presenting. Sorry. Thank you. So, thank you, Clinton. Any questions in relation to item 5.6? Thank you. Uh, I'm wondering what the if this motion at council failed what would happen has 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 funding already been expended or i'm just wanting to know if council said no this has gone over budget by too much what would be what would be the outcome there uh through the chair the first point to clarify is that um, the works haven't gone over budget this is about a contract award that has gone over the CEO's delegation. But but I'm pretty sure they did go over budget over the what was originally you know, is it I think it was almost it was a substantial amount. About twenty five percent. through the chair, all of that information is contained in the report. Yeah, so I understand it. So again, my original question if we said no. Uh, if councils hypothetically said, no, look, I'm sick of infrastructure projects going over the budget because of this and that, we're not going to approve this extra expenditure, or we're not going to approve this procurement, what would then happen to the project? How much of it, how much of it, I guess, has already been spent through your chair? Um, and where do we then go? Are there other parties like I see SA Power Networks, have they already done some stuff to their own infrastructure? Would they then be saying, oh, we had a memorandum of understanding that you would do X, Y, Z? Like what, what actually happens? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, um, it's a good question. I would have to um, work through that. We're, we're in contract with a contractor, so we would have to 
to um, work to the requirements of that contract. Um, what we're dealing with here is an initial contract sum of uh, just under a million dollars, which didn't trigger the need for council approval. So that, that's the issue we're dealing with. Um, we had held contingency for the project, but outside of that original contract award value um, within the contract budget. The issue we're dealing with now is that um, through the performance of the work, the contractors had to um, submit variations. And for that reason, it's tipped over a million dollars. So they, I would, this is my initial assessment. <laughs> They've performed the works in accordance with the contract. I think we would be required as council to then um, oblige to pay them. So in short, um, I'd have to work through the contract details to give you an exact answer on that. But So the work's already been done, that's the contract? Not, not all of the work has been completed, no, it's not, it's not practical, practically complete. And but it can't be practically complete until we resolve this issue. Right. And so, so you, you've, you've, the administration through chair has signed a contract for some amount under one million dollars, approximately nine hundred fifty thousand or something like that. And that that's been signed, and we're obliged to fulfil that. That's my, that's my question. That's the crux that I'm trying to get to. How far progressed is this project? Uh, through the chair, the project is well progressed, um, but we would need to deal with the outcome of next week's meeting, should that be the case. Could um, you look into that and give a, an answer to that offline on an email in regards to the what it, uh, Councillor Hyde is asking? So how will it affect the project if it doesn't if, go ahead? If, uh, through the Chair, if that helps with the understanding, yes. Yeah. Yep. All right. And, and just, just, a, just a further comment, I noticed it said in the report that Council had endorsed mm -hmm. Um, uh, endorsed that the project would be would cost more than originally envisaged. Of course, it wasn't, in my view, endorsed chair. It was noted in a in a quarterly report. It was not specifically endorsed. If I was asked to endorse it, I wouldn't endorse it. I just want to make that clear. Thank you. Any other questions, Councillor Martin? Yeah, um, I, a rhetorical one first. I don't know why I'm agreeing with Councillor Hyde so much, but um, I, I, I too have concerns about that additional allocation. Uh, and I wonder whether there is a problem with the, the way in which we're going about uh, contracting these arrangements that we should come up with such a substantial variation. Um, as I'm reading it, the total budget was 1.6 million, 66, and it's gone up at paragraph six by 560,000. That's a, you know, that's more than contingency. Is there a problem in the way in which we're going to market that, and the next item is the same, that we're just having these blowouts? Uh, yeah. Um, through the chair, there's a couple of um, what I'll call root causes that underpin um, how this has happened. Um, one's in relation to um, the, the nature of how we um, plan and design and then execute on um, certain projects. Um, we committed as an executive um, to, uh, to review um, how we procure and as well as how we manage our contracts. Um, so there's a piece of work internally which I'm happy to bring back to committee uh, further down the track once we have um, a bit more sort of meat on the bones in relation to, to this. And one final question. If, if the council decides to approve this um, substantial increase in expenditure, why do we also need to give the chief executive authority um, um, to alter the contract in any way going forward? to meet the scope of the project. I mean, if it's 560 to finish it, does that suggest that it might be more and therefore we have to give the CEO the authority to do that? Or is that point two not necessary? Uh, through the chair, um, the second part to the recommendation is really attached to the, to the first um, uh, request for approval in that um, the count, uh, Chief Executive Officer would have the, the delegation if the council so wished um, for the contract sum to be over a million dollars and by virtue of that would then have um, the delegation to negotiate um, the contract to completion. And, and does that mean by inference 
over and above the additional 560,000 that's sought, or just the 560? Through the chair, uh, within the currently approved budget. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just, just one more question when we talk about the root cause of this, these sort of sorts of issues. Um, uh, in the the audit committee, which um, where a couple of reports came back into us, um, uh, which looked at, and I, I acknowledge the Clinton Commission to these reports. They looked at issues with Gawler Place, which were obviously substantial. I think there was one other project as well. And it said, and I know that that was a bigger project, but it said uh, along the lines of one, you need contingency. Now, I know that, but two, you need to do a reference design. We need to do some more thorough investigative works before you undertake projects. Um, would it be the administration's view that there wasn't thorough enough investigative works on this and that's why we're seeing such a substantial change to this like could could this have been avoided that you know there are things that i guess you can't avoid um uh, uh, but most of the things you can avoid could this have been avoided at the start of the project uh, through the chair um a couple of things could have been avoided Given that the contract value was fairly close to the $1 million, we could have easily brought a report into council. Uh, we weren't required to, and it wasn't triggered through our procurement process to do so. Um, so that's the first thing that we could have improved. Um, in terms of the latent condition, the scope um, changes, uh, some of the design issues, a lot of those things are typical of any contract. Uh, we deal with those on a daily basis in terms of the changes to um, the requirements of the contract and how the work is performed. And as a result, there are variations. Um, there can be delays due to weather. There can be all, all sorts of things that contribute to that. Um, the thing with this particular project um, that had we taken uh, a different approach to planning and investigation and design, we could have er earlier identified the need to uh, modify the electricity supply, which is where the variation from the SA power ne networks came in at $328,000, which is the, the main proportion of that um, additional cost that we're dealing with at the moment. So yes, in answer to your question, um, further investigation and design work may have um, identified that um, that issue earlier in the process. Thank you, Chair. So just quickly confirming the uh, point number five, where you said separate to this contract, I said PAN that was paid almost $330,000. So that amount isn't necessarily going through the contractor that's doing the work, that's directly through as a PAN that works for electrical stuff. Am I correct in saying that? Through the chair, that's correct, and that's included in the overall budget for delivery of the project. One, right. Just one, one final point is um, this was obviously not a council law initiated initiative. Um, where did this come from? Did the users of this park say we don't want to generate her anymore? Because uh, to, to be honest, if I would picked it up at the time, I would have said I don't give a stuff if gluttony don't want generators, we're in a $40 million deficit situation right now. Thank you through the chair. Um, so in the last term of council, when we um, um, when we developed the Adelaide Parkland Events Management Plan, um, part of the review that we did was also the pricing around the use of various parks across the city. Um, and one of the proposals that emerged through that piece of work was that certain parks, due to their location um, and due to their amenity, um, attract a higher price for use of that space. Along with that, there was also a recommendation to make sure that those spaces had access to water um, and electricity and sewerage to enable those more premium spaces uh, to operate efficiently and effectively. This project um, was in train for about three years um, and it got deferred or removed from forward renewal um, or infra infrastructure projects um, about two years ago. It um, then came online and we, obviously through COVID it got delayed, um, but there have been a lot of work done um, with many 
um, people that use that space uh, to just make sure that it had the infrastructure needed to enable that space to work effectively. And so am I correct in assuming that Rundle Park would be classed as the premium heartland site type? So the chair, both Rymel and Rundle Park are classified as premium. Yep, which we charge a maximum of $66 uh, a day for per thousand square metres. Whatever according, the current fees and charges are. According yeah. to the schedule yeah. then. Yeah. And, and so noting the advice of the audit committee said that we should be doing cost benefit analyses and that sort of thing. Um, do we know how long it will take to yield a return on investment for this uh, very expensive project? At sixty-six dollars per thousand square meters per day. Through the chair, so the audit committee um, asked us to get better at presenting council with cost-benefit analysis when it comes to understanding the impact that their spend has, and in relation to uh, projects. As I have mentioned, this project has been in train for quite some period of time and emanated from a previous term of council. Um, at this point, if you wish us to go away and work out. Um, and provide you with some CBA that sits over the top of the use of that park, um, the uh, cost uh, and the investment that, um, that event organisers also place and put into um, activating the city versus um, the uh, general economic impact that events have been certainly, but that's a major piece of work. I'm not sure we have the skills in-house to be able to do it, um, but certainly um, doing a CBA on a, on a project like this um, for a million dollar project, um, we, when we come back to council with the approach that we'll be taking in the future, we'll certainly have some um, various options for you to consider, but at this point, it's, uh, you know, the project's nearly completed. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Long. Through this whole conversation, I was just always intrigued here that when you're talking about cost benefit analysis, um, in this, is there an opportunity because of all the savings that we're actually providing, the people putting on these events and these spaces, that we get some sort of a, a an increase in the amount that we can charge simply because uh, we're saving a considerable amount of money and some of that we should be able to, uh, you know, achieve for ourselves in improving the service and therefore making it you know, a much more uh, you know, attractive place. Is that a question? Uh, thank you, um, through the Chair. So the, the fees and charges and the approach that we're, that we're taking at the moment um, emanated from, the, as I said, the last term of Council. There was a comprehensive review undertaken. Um, we use saddles um, to benchmark um, the price of land use here in the city. Um, the previous council, um, the, the view predominantly was that, um, that the, to, be, to be a festival city um, and to be a city that, that um, attracts festivals, attracts events, um, that uh, you, know, you can certainly make money from that green space, but there was certainly the, the steer from the previous council that actually the role of the um, City of Adelaide is to be an event-friendly city. Um, we can absolutely undertake a, a, another review of those fees and charges. Obviously, you have locked in your fees and charges for next financial year already, um, but if you wish us to undertake a piece of work, um, around the fees and charges and the use of green space for events, then we can certainly do that and perhaps schedule it into next year's work plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we'll just go on to the next item. I believe Clinton, you're presenting that one as well. Uh, so we've got item 5.7 uh, in regards to the Quinta Kenyan um, Placeways. Any questions, Councillor Martin? Yeah, um, I guess the first question is, is this correct? Am I reading that the city has created a um, an inclusive playground for people with disabilities and it's not disability compliant? Uh, through the chair, sorry, Councillor, where are you referring to? I'm referring to 5.7. And uh, the report suggests that in order to ensure that we meet DDA compliance, 
it, uh, the administration is seeking to increase the city's contribution by about 80% uh, from about a quarter of a million to $200,000. Um, well, look specifically, um, which bits of the playground are not DVA compliant? Uh, through the chair, um, this report is here to talk about our contract award. I see council approval, so I'm not sure. Because well, there's no detail here, the administration is saying to us that the money is required for variations and additional scope to meet DDA compliance. And it goes on and say community expectations. Which bits are not DDA compliant that require us to increase the budget by 80%? Uh, through the chair, happy to take a question on notice, Councillor, if you'd like a, uh, some more detail around that. But here tonight, we're um, talking to a similar issue to what we've just um, discussed in 5.6 around um, Council's um, delegation around uh, awarding a contract over a million dollars. Okay, well, I'm hearing that, but uh, there is a difference between the last item and this one. Uh, this one uh, is telling us that we have a playground that says it's a big sign on saying exclusive entry disability um, and we're saying we're being told as councillors that the playground is not disability compliant should we have a sign up on bits of it saying do not use not compliant or is it just a minor feature? I'm struggling because there's no detail here. Expensive minor feature. Mm -hmm. uh, through you, Chair. Sorry, Councillor, from a process point of view, this is this is the same as the last report. We're dealing with a contract award um, and delegation issue. And again, I'm happy to provide any further details should you require them around DDA compliance? Or well, Chair, Chair, look, I, I do understand that. I guess what I'm asking for is some kind of additional knowledge so that the community doesn't jump to the conclusion that this is in fact a threat to safety rather than a means of facilitating the enjoyment of a park by people with disabilities. Yeah, uh, thank you, through the Chair. Um, when we talk about root cause, this is another example, but for different reasons around cost overrun. Um, this was announced um, by the state government with an allocation of a million. We agreed as a council to co-contribute by the time we got through design and ongoing um, understanding of that space, it gone up by another million. Um, so it's another example, I think, of where we could get better um, as a as a jointly, um, as a council and as an organisation, just how we better manage it. In terms of whether the playground is or is not DDA compliant, um, I would need to take that on notice. We do take our, um, our obligations around playgrounds really seriously. Members will remember in Park 15 when there was um, any um, sense that um, a playground was not uh, compliant. We move quickly to make sure that those spaces are safe. I'm happy to take it on notice and provide you all um, with an update um, over the coming days to enable you to then consider this um, contract award value item uh, next Tuesday. Can I also ask, um, as a precaution, if parts of the playground, the equipment, are not disability compliant, that we put a notice on them or uh, put some tape around them so that people uh, aren't injured? Councillor, as I said, we take our obligations for public safety um, really seriously and we will manage that in accordance with the guidelines that we have already in place to make sure our public spaces are as safe as possible. Uh, Clinton, did you wish to add? Uh, just Further to that CEO, we have had the playground audited, councillor, and it has passed a safety audit. So, um, but we are dealing with the finalisation of the contract and there are some um, final construction works to be undertaken. Okay, well, I, um, 
I, I'm confused because if we've done a safety audit that's passed it, but we need money to make it disability compliant, there's a contradiction there. But anyway, I'll, I'll move on and I'll accept that the administration will come back to us. Um, my next question is, is this enough money? Uh, because um, I note uh, in the administration's explanation, and I visited the site today, there is no access area. Um, there was to have been in the original plans, and I remember those plans well, a capacity for uh, people ferrying uh, disabled people, either by private vehicle or buses, uh, to be able to park close to the park. Um, as best I could tell, the closest is the bowling club car park, uh, which has a couple of disability spaces, but no bus space. Otherwise, it's a few hundred metres to the nearest road. How are we going to construct uh, for $200,000 those things about which we don't know uh, that are not disability compliant, as well as construct a roadway with turning circle for buses and parking? Is, is this enough? Through the chair, yes, it is enough. Um, and all of the works you've just described are included within the approved budget. Um, happy to meet you out there anytime, Councillor Martin, and take you through the scope and, and how it'll all end up. Okay, and may I just ask uh, the administration um, why we've actually opened it? I understand that the Lord Mayor had an official opening ceremony in December. Um, um, and the thing is not complete. Uh, through the chair, we had uh, we did have an opening ceremony. I think it was in December. I, I couldn't be there on the day. Um, we did have some additional um, scope items that couldn't be completed prior to that opening. I think the uh, you would have seen out there today the um, uh, dis dis disability accessible toilet, the changing places toilet that. Um, Unfortunately, due to COVID, was stuck in Melbourne or New South Wales for several months, and we we're waiting for delivery of that uh, that toilet. So um, the uh, play space was opened prior to the completion of that toilet construction and a couple of other minor items. Um, I, if I could well, actually yeah, through the chair, uh, so that it wasn't an opening ceremony. Um, there was uh, the playground had been complete to that stage. Um, as Clinton said, the toilet, the disability toilet was going on. So we haven't done the official opening, uh, which will have Clinton's family in attendance. Uh, that'll be done once these works are complete. So Clinton's family doesn't, didn't go to the opening in December? There hasn't been an opening ceremony. The park was completed to a, a level and we had, um, uh, we were going to do the ceremony once the toilets were finished and the rest of the work is finished. So what, what, be... what, what was it then? What was it? The, 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 the minister thought that she was at an opening, mm -hmm. Minister Lansing. My council, remember? Yeah. But also finally, COVID during that time? Or? Finally, a chair, a question, a final Does question. Think, yeah, you think oh, oh, sorry. Final, a final question, um, ancillary to the report. Um, there is a perception the playground was closed because of the fringe. Um, may I ask that in future, if not be closed, or surrounded by tape for the entire duration, um, if we are going to provide a disability facility, it would be good if it could be open all the time. Uh, thank you. Um, so, so through the chair, that's really disappointing to hear. My understanding was it was supposed to be yeah. remain open and accessible. Um, if it had been raised with us, we would have obviously worked with uh, Glatini to make sure that there was appropriate signage um, and we would have communicated through our access and inclusion and on our public website to make sure uh, that the playground um, was communicated that it was open. So um, we'll endeavour to uh, take that on notice and improve for future use of that space. Councillor Moran, did you want to have something to say? I had your name down. You had your hand up, wasn't it? Okay. Next item. We have next item being um, item number 5.8, the Adelaide Oval Precinct Draft Community Land Management Plan. We have Michelle here as well. Um, opening up to any questions. No questions? 
All good? No. no it's all bad. It's all bad. Yeah. Well, you're, uh, have you got any questions? Yeah, yeah, quite a few. It's quite a few. Okay, well then, got far away, Councillor Martin. Um, thank you. Um, um, when the recommendation says at two that we're setting uh, the number of events at oval number two each calendar year to six, does it mean there can never be more than six events at, at LA oval two? I'm like getting the administration saying true and here and not. What's the correct answer? Michelle, did you, who's answering? Theo, Michelle? Yes. Sorry. So the, the question was, does that mean it would be limited to six? Yes. Yes, that's correct. There would be no more than six events there. That's correct. See, my, my interpretation of it is that there would be six events that would be authorised without approval of the CEO and that any further events would have to be requested. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Okay. So, so, so you presiding member, just for clarity, the, the CLNP talks to a set limit which would uh, not require the SMA to come to council. What they do is they come on an individual basis and is presented to council as council members. That's not to say that they can't come up outside of that and request anything, but again, CLMA, CLMP will be explicit in regards to six that they may wish to come to council for consideration. So that recommendation too is not correct at all. It's, uh, it says, include setting the number of single day community cultural or music events permitted on Adelaide Oval 2 each calendar year to six. Okay. So what it means is agreeing to setting the number of single day community cultural or music events permitted at Adelaide Oval number two each calendar year without the approval of the City of Adelaide Council or CEO um, to six. Okay, so if, if the Adelaide, uh, if the SMA um, uh, decided that it had a six day music festival between January 1st and 6th, uh, it could then come back to the City of Adelaide and say, well, I think we'd like to do that again in August, September, May. That, that would be possible, wouldn't it, under what's contained in here, isn't it? See ya. Knowing the SMA, potentially, Councillor, so if you, um, if you have any recommendations around tightening the wording to make sure that that type of activity doesn't occur, then I suggest that that would be helpful. And can, can I ask if there are to be more than six events, is my reading of the documents and particularly the uh, feedback from the community that that approval for anything more than six events will rest not with the elected body um, but with your good self as acting CEO? Elected body. It's the elected body. Elected, the elected body. body, I wouldn't take that under any sort of delegation. Well, me all the money some of the submissions are saying that you, uh, you would do that, so that's why I'm asking. What that. is not in the papers, that, that would, that's correct, Councillor Martin. So yeah, no, no, it's in the submissions. Um, <laughs> well, that's completely yeah. different. Um, I think Lord Mayor, can, would you like to um, I was going to ask some questions. more questions. We can come back to you, Councillor No, no, Martin. no, no. no. Chair, you do this to me every time. It's I've just done it twice right. tonight, not every time. No, I've no, just done do it, it twice. Meeting. I would like to give the floor an even um, an No, even it doesn't run. work that way because then you gave Councillor Hyde a, a considerably longer time than me. And he was asking consecutive questions. And so so was uh, asking in, a, in regards to the same uh, issue, same question. Yeah, you're, being, you're being less than objective. Well, I would like to go to the Lord Mayor and then we can come back to you, Councillor Martin. How about that? Thank I, you. Lord Mayor? Uh, I was actually simply going to uh, uh, support Councillor Martin and his interpretation because that was something that we I also challenged in terms of it's six, but it could be they can come back 
anything after six to ask um, as they've had to submit now. So currently they have to submit for any answers um, with count for council approval. This would give them six without coming to council for approval and after that they would have to come back to council. And that's been my understanding since the get-go. So just to make sure that that's actually also how that was explained to um, APLA. Okay, thank you, Councillor Martin. That's very kind of you, Chair. I appreciate it. Um, uh, now, I, I, in reviewing the results, it seems to me that a strong majority have particular views about the proposals that were put to them. Um, in respect of Adelaide Oval 2, the proposal that is for the concerts, parking and other things, um, were opposed by 55% of those who participated in the consultation. Um, in respect of Pennington Gardens and Creswell Gardens, 58% um, disagreed with the proposal put to them. In respect of Stella Bowen, 61% disagreed. So uh, we've got 55, 58, 61% of um, what would be regarded, I think, as a majority of respondents um, uh, not agreeing with the council in, um, in respect of what's proposed in regard to the community uh, land management plan. And yet the administration is recommending that we... Sorry, I'll wait. Sorry, we're just, we're, Lord Mayor has to go. We're just working out if we've got quorum. So um, just one moment, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. So um, I'll just go, I see, sorry. Um, all right. Um, so why, why if we've got such majority opposition to what is being proposed, are we saying, let's go ahead? Uh, Tom? Thank you, Presiding Member. If I can direct councillors to uh, section 14 when we talk about Creswell, Pennington and whatever. If you look at the recommendation from the administration that says we recommend no changes to be made in this aspect of the draft CONP. If you look in the, the peripheral areas under section 25 of the report, again, the administration recommends uh, no changes to be made in this section. If you look under parking in section 27, again, the administration recommends no changes. The changes are, as you're highlighting, is it specifically in Oval 2 in regards to events, um, and that's where it currently sits at the moment. No, that's not what I read. That's not what I read. What I read is that it's possible for the SMA to have events in Pennington and Creswell Gardens, and that the administration's recommendation is that they have first dibs on events in Pennington and Creswell Gardens. Yes, that's what it says. I'm sure I'm not reading a different document. And there is no agreement with regard to car parking, and yet this, this uh, uh, community land management plan proposes that we allow parking for, um, what is it, 1,200, 1,300 cars. Have I misread it? In, in respect to the parking, there's an AMBA provision in the licence, which is um, derived from the Adelaide Oval Act for parking uh, across that licence area, which includes Stella Bowen Park and Oval Number 2. So it doesn't dictate any numbers, but that's what the SMA think they can fit into those spaces. But we acknowledge that uh, we, it's a question, but we acknowledge that that is now part of their right to use that Adelaide Oval 2 for parking for events in a way that we have not done so before by incorporating it into the community land management plan. It's a reflection of their statutory rights. Uh, well, um, I, okay. Um, so, what we are incorporating into the, and I will, I will say it to you, and you correct me if I'm wrong. What we're incorporating is that the Adelaide Oval um, Stadium Management Authority can hold uh, six concerts a year in Adelaide Oval 2 can come to the council as many times as they like in a year for more concerts. We're agreeing to incorporate in the community land management plan that they can have car parking, which they think they can fit 1,300 cars in. We're agreeing to the construction of a stadium or small stadium capable of seating 100 people on the verge of Adelaide Oval 2 at a location yet to be determined. 
We're agreeing that the Adelaide Oval has first dibs on having events in Pennington Gardens and Creswell Gardens. We have ruled out the Colonel Light area, but we've also accepted Stella Bond and incorporated those into the community land management plan in a way that they weren't before. Well, thank you, Mar Martin. Can you just clarify the use of Creswell and Pennington, please? The, um, the areas known as Creswell Gardens and Pennington Gardens sit outside of the licence area, so they don't have any rights to use those on the first come you know, at all basis. Um, then we put those provisions for the number and type of events into those areas so that the public could hold events in those areas. Well, I'm, I'm very sorry. I read that they have first rights and I, I take that back. I clearly did not read that. Um, okay. Um, none of this uh, mentions, but is it possible if, if these changes are approved for the Stadium Management Authority to, on the one occasion, hire uh, or at least conduct an event at Adelaide Oval 2, Stella Bowen Park, Pennington Gardens and Crystal Gardens? Sorry, is it possible? It's not canvassed in the report that the Adelaide Oval Stadium Management Authority, having what I understood or read to be first rights over those areas, could on the one occasion have the one event or several events at the same uh, time on Pennington Gardens, Creswell Gardens, Stella Bowen Park and Adelaide Oval 2 under the provisions of the Community Land Management Plan were adopted. With the, uh, with the, with the approval of council in respect to um, Pendleton Gardens and Cresswell Gardens, and as long as they meet the, the criteria regarding the number of attendees and the type of event. So that's uh, Adelaide Oval, what is it? Can you remind me, Adelaide Oval 2, 16,000? I think it's less, I think it's 12 to 15,000. And no, sorry, 15. just in terms of those other uses, obviously the Adelaide Parkland Events Management Plan does describe um, and uh, put limits on the use of those spaces as well. Yeah, only people. And it will also step out what type of um, activity that um, that the um, that council would like to see in that space. So we do sometimes describe in quite a lot of detail the use of spaces. Oh, I can I can see that. I know that Pennington Gardens and Creswell Gardens can't be used after six pm, but that doesn't mean that all of the venues can be used in concert. Not necessarily concert, in concert together. There's nothing in the community land management plan that favours that. Okay, Councillor Brown. Uh, yes, just one question. When we're saying, just um, Phil's pointing out, Pennington um, Gardens and Fairfield Gardens are now, and you've said for the public use for events. Were they envisaged to be event spaces when we looked at the parklands? Because in my knowledge, they've only ever been used by SACA um, and the public haven't used them. And I would have thought Creswell Gardens particularly was unsuitable, except it does have a double-sided bar that comes through from the oval. So who would be using it? And did we envisage this as a public event space? The answer is no. See, um, um, Sorry, it's you. I'm sorry to answer that. Uh, thank you. Um, I, I don't have the plank with me tonight, but I'm pretty sure we're quite prescriptive around what can and can't be used, noting the location and noting the area in terms of memorials and places of reflection all through that area. Um, I think the last time um, the uh, administration uh, signed off use of that uh, space was for uh, religious ceremony um, and based on the feedback we got, Councillor Moran, I think you brought it to our attention that there was complaints from people coming down King William Street and were offended by the religious wording on the marquee and you remember that we, um, after that, tightened up uh, the Adelaide Events Management Plan to make sure that things like um, like that didn't didn't take place um, in the public area. That was the last time that was that space from memory sort of triggered so in this really conversation. So we don't really expect Creswell Gardens to be used. Um, are we opening any gates there now with this? Are we presenting it as an event space? 
I mean, let's face it, the only people who are using it, except for that odd religious thing, is the, foot, the cricket and the football, because it has a double-sided bar straight out to it. So they always visit using casual guns in a backdoor way as part of their thing. So are we making that, even though we say we offer it to the public first, it's never going to be used by the public, do we want to be a little bit stricter about the use of that? I suppose that's for council, but I think to say that we're offering the public service and then if they want to use it, they're the only people that can use it and have a licensed area there really easily. So I'll be moving if we get further restricted use because it will be clear for now. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Um, you don't have to Any other questions? Councillor Hyde? I'm just wondering. In, in this area, I suppose, in this part of North Adelaide, how, how many residents are, are in there in sort of upper North Adelaide? Thousands. Oh, how many? Thousands. And, and how many do we envisage may be affected, affected by, by this sort of use? And have we got, have we got that information, CEO? Uh, through the chair. Um, we. So if you think about, um, and we do this across all our parkland spaces, where, um, where there's a, a clear adjacent, adjacent to a, re a highly residential zone, we take a lot more um, care around um, particularly noise management. So if you have a look through there, there is a lot of um, residential um, along Pennington and round up to Braun. Um, my, over many years, and it's mainly in relation to events held lower down, uh, the complaints are usually sort of, um, sort of depending which way the wind's going, but it's usually um, sort of across there and into Broome. When it comes to Adelaide Oval, obviously those res residential places are very, very, very close to the Oval, and so any um, any changes to that location, um, you know, the, the, those uh, residents do obviously I uh, want to make sure council um, is clear on, on their concerns. And, so in terms of numbers, obviously in the whole of North Adelaide, I'd need to just go back and check check the ABS data. And so in, in, in terms, through your chair, in terms of the 30 odd people that submitted to the consultation, um, was, there, was there a concentration on Pennington Terrace or was it sort of all, all throughout that section of North Adelaide going up the hill or? So through the chair, though, we don't have that level of detail in terms of the submissions. But everyone on your say chair has to say where they're, where they're from. I, obviously, you scrubble the personal particulars out of it, as you should, for a public agenda. But I'm just trying to get an understanding. Because I'm just saying, if, if Councillor Martin distributed flyers throughout that whole section of North Adelaide and only 30 people responded, I'm trying to get a feel for how big a problem this is. If there are a thousand flyers and only 30 responded, then it's less than 5%. If it was only 500 flyers and 30 responded, then it's, you know, you're going just less than 10%. So I'm just trying to understand the extent of the problem, where the people that submitted Personal came Personal explanation, please. I did not distribute flyers throughout the area. I did the area around Commode Street and down, not the whole of North um, So then I suppose, Chair, could we get an understanding of how many flyers that was? Anyway, Michelle, would you like to elaborate on that, please? So, so through the chair, we can go back and have a look at our your study data and, and see if we can find a, a pattern of, of yes. you know, the geographic location of where submissions. Yeah, yeah. even if perhaps, Chair, if we're able to give a, you know, Pennington Terrace, there were five. On Montefiore, there were this. On Strangways, there was this many. That would be that would be really useful in helping to understand the extent of the opposition to this. I think that, uh, that I can be on the table for next meeting. Correct, Councillor Moran. Can I just make a point that I don't think using Ken uh, Pennington Gardens and Creswell Gardens is necessarily a noise issue um, or an inconvenience to the North Adelaide residents. I don't. That's certainly not what I'm pinning my opinion on. It is that it has memorial plaques. It is a place designated by the church as quiet contemplation for um, stillborn children and 
um, I can't remember the other three. They are community suicide. gardens, suicide victims. Bruce uh, suicide Bruce suicide Gardens is a little suicide. tiny garden with the memorial oak that needs to be protected on its roots. So, so I think it's irrelevant, really, as to the noise issues there. These are just inappropriate gardens to be used open slather for events. Um, and uh, so I, I think sort of mining and saying only 30, 30 or 30 people responded, so therefore who gives a toss is not the point. Thank you. Um, no further questions. We'll just go to the next item, 5.9, Draft Community Land Management Plan. Um, Michelle, I think you're presenting this one as well. Okay. We take the paper as read. Any questions? No, we're all good. Thank you. We'll move on. Next item, five ten. SA water tank main replacement. We have uh, Clinton probably on this one. Do you have any questions? Okay, we've gone through 5.9 and we're now up to 5.10. Yes, correct. It comes after 5.9. Thank you. Um, um, yes, um, any questions on 5.10? No, no questions? Uh, just, just one thing, one thing that, that was Prompted. Obviously, there'll be remedial work done after the fact, Chair. Has there been any consideration noting noting the sort of allowances we make to support events in this part of the city? Has there been any consideration around what landscaping changes may assist events that use the park in the future? And like, I'm just thinking it might be a good time to think about changing a couple of things around if you're in there with machinery and what have you. Has, has any of that been contemplated? Or? Uh, through the chair, uh, what type of landscaping changes we see? Oh, oh, sorry, I'm, not. I, I, I'm just guessing. You're going in there, you're digging a big hole, you're taking out trees and what have you. Um, there'll be remedial work that's done, and I know they're going to plant some trees there and such. Um, has, has I suppose SA Water or our infrastructure team spoken to our events team and said, "Oh, do you have any?" You know, to go to the people that run the garden through chair and say, do, are there any are there any spots you don't want us to plant trees because they're really inconvenient for you, or if you wanted to make changes to how you lay out your um, uh, your event and your site map, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you know, because now might be the time to actually do some tweaking while we're while we're in. Uh, through the chair, yes, yes. Yeah, so we definitely had the events team involved in the negotiations with SA Water. Yep. And and I suppose, Chair, did that result in in any changes, or they're all very happy there? Or uh, through the chair, so um, the landscaping plans include um, replacement of trees uh, in a two to one ratio, which is a great outcome, um, plus some additional plantings and, and landscaping. But it's all been done in accordance with the boundaries around the current events infrastructure plans. Yeah. Um, with future allowance for creep and movement um, should the events wish to, to change their event layouts. So it's all been considered in, in the landscape plans that have been developed. Perfect, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. Let's go to item 5 and 11. We have Grace presenting. I would say that everyone's read their papers. And we'll go straight to questions. Any questions? Councillor Martin. Oh, oh, you you just... oh, no, I saw you first. Please go ahead. Well, it's very rare to usually see him. Oh, no, I don't want you to think that I'm not considering you, Councillor Martin. I wouldn't even dream. Oh, thank you. Okay. Um, can I uh, just ask, because there's no mention of it in the documents, um, am I uh, to understand, as has been previously referenced, that there will be no capital expenditure whatever 
in 21-22 at the Aquatic Centre unless something obviously breaks and has to be replaced. Thanks, Councillor Martin, through the chair. Um, the uh, renewal um, amounts for the Aquatic Centre uh, are included in the plan, but uh, not for 21 22, you know, aside from 135,000 and some equipment. So the renewal works all occur after? From 22 23 onwards through the life of the plan, for the 10 year plan, equating to just over $15 million. Okay, thank you. Um, the consultation documents, that is the ones that are, are going out um, to the public, uh, at 482 and 483 especially, blame our financial predicament on COVID-19 uh, and it references borrowing too. Now, given that the COVID costs, which uh, I, I know went up $8 million in about two weeks in uh, March, um, uh, given that the, at best it's $28 million, why has the administration failed to mention that in the context of $60 million of operating deficits before COVID hit and borrowings of 70, closer to $80 million in the years prior? Why, why is COVID, which is the lesser incident in all of this being blamed and no reference to the consistent overspending of operating deficits and, and consistent borrowings prior to COVID? Thanks for the question, Councillor, through the chair. Um, I think it's, it's just more to reflect the fact that um, what we what present this position, this council project is around a, cover, a recovery position and it's taking us time to um, to grow out of something um, that, yes, has been a, a accumulation of, of things over the years. Um, there's no, I guess it's, it's unquestionable though that the, the impact of COVID has been a very significant short-term um, impact um, that we are, you know, needing to, to deal with. Um, the 28 million, and, and we'll bring this to you in a, in a financial impact report coming um, before the end of this financial year, but the 28 million was purely just around the income impact only. Um, we haven't actually provided, uh, I guess, what, what I've described as the full impact of COVID and therefore what the full cool recovery of COVID looks like. Um, and I, you know, I'd, I'd say that you need to be able to present that to council in coming um, months, definitely, um, and we've committed to that. Um, but yeah, that's that's the focus of the commentary around the budget is around the recovery and what recovery actually looks like and how it takes time. So. Look, can I suggest to the acting CEO that we include recovering from our own mismanagement as well? I mean, that is the primary reason why we have so much financial uh, strife, not not COVID, and yet COVID is the only thing that is mentioned. But uh, uh, I, I just think it's important for the credibility of the administration that it doesn't gloss over in preparing these documents. A CEO. Thank you, through the chair. I take great offence at that commentary, Councillor Martin. Well, I take great offence at that mismanagement of our finances. I beg your pardon. Well, I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon, please. I well, take uh, offence at that. Well, Acting CEO. So this is our can question I, time. So if can, you can limit your conversations to questions, not direct insults, that would be really appreciated, Councillor Martin. It's Thank not an insult at all. Yes, it is, is Councillor Martin. Repeated, that was a direct insult. Operating deficits are financial mismanagement. Councillor Martin, you are Councillor. You vote on the system. items before you on the financials. You have been here for a very long time. So then that I've is been on your. Against them. Sorry, Councillor Martin. Chair, you, it's too I am not. Oh, I am it not. Is team Adelaide. You oh, have been, Councillor Martin. Team Adelaide. You need to stop, and you need to stop just now insults and have this moment here it's as not questions. An as questions. This is your problem. If you, you cannot continue with questions to administration, then I suggest that I'll move on to somebody else. Well, Councillor Howard. I was actually going to ask us to include in the papers um, the membership of the audit committee and those corresponding deficits because I think Councillor Martin was on there for most of them. Yes, um, we're we're all of them. Um, Councillor, 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 Councillor. That is a fact. That is a fact that you were on the audit committee. That's a fact that you've been on a council. To direct this completely onto administration is a direct insult. No. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Chair, a personal explanation. I am permitted to do that. 
I am not saying the administration is responsible for the mismanagement of the budget. You directly said saying, that. You directly said no, that, Councillor Martin. I did not say that. I said there is a risk it will reflect poorly on the administration if it allows these documents to go out to the public without acknowledging the role of the financial mismanagement that has occurred in this council since Team Adelaide has been here. And since you've been on Councillor Council, Councillor Martin, you I, have I been have directly voted, responsible for being on audit committee and you did not say that. I, I have that voted is are moving on. You are being, are moving you are on. being very offensive. I, oh, really? I would say that you completely have insulted. Councillor Moran, you're not here to stick up for Councillor Martin. Thank you very much. Councillor I find that very offensive. I find a lot of things in this council very offensive. We are moving on. Because I am in the chair and I am saying so. Councillor Hyde. Um, I just wanted to ask uh, through you, Chair, if we could have a bit of an elaboration on, and I really want to commend the administration for the great clarity um, within within this report. This is one of the first budgets that I think has gone to consultation. The last one was actually not too bad. A uh, heck of a lot better than the one immediately before that. I, I really do like that we're including the full-time equivalents um, uh, in this now. I think I think that's one of your biggest items of expenditure is your wages, and and your workforce is very important. But it's 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 also important to understand where your rates being spent. Having said that, I'm looking at parklands and open space, um, and I, I see a total net of minus $24 million, which is, of course, a huge amount of money. And I'm seeing a total of directly employed FTE, 112 people, um, and indirectly a further 25. Um, I'm, I'm looking to understand, Chair, is, is that, like, has there, has there, is that also including um, sort of the teams that will manage other sort of plants and vegetation in the council area it is okay do, do, do we have through you chair an indication of how much is just for parklands and how much is for city streets and squares do we have a split squares, squares are parklands i know but the, it's it's you know we've got, we've got hun many hundreds of hectares of parkland i just no i don't have it to hand no, we haven't no. split, 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 yeah, split it that way. Okay. So, so, yeah, we haven't, we don't have yeah. right. understood. Um, and so I guess, is, is it is perhaps uh, the feel of the administration through you, Chair, that, that the lion's share of that 24 mil is parklands? Or, or I just, I, I'm just trying to get an understanding. Well, what are you seeking here, Councillor Hyde? Can you elaborate? Because I think it would be uh, need more for clarification or the understanding of the question, or just take it on notice. And so, just to go back a step, it'd be helpful to understand what you're trying to know. So you'll remember um, audit committee did a really deep dive into parklands expenditure. So that is the best source of truth if you're looking for the totality of what council spends on the parklands. Mm -hmm. That's probably your best starting point. Um, what this is doing is aggregating um, through a, a transparent way um, the resources associated with maintaining parklands to their current um, state. Okay, I, I suppose when, when that uh, then came to audit committee, I note that when I originally introduced the motion asking for us to calculate how much we spend on parklands, it came in at, uh, I want to say, $26, $27 million, including capital expenditure, which also includes some state government grants. Since then, it then went through the, the meat grinder and, and with KPMG and came out the other end of audit and it jumped back down to 15. And I think it was actually the Lord Mayor that picked up and said, you know, perhaps we need a little bit more work done. Is that work still underway or? Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, just for clarity, in my mind, and as a resident of the city, um, I, I would I would prefer to, to prefer to divorce um, parklands as in green belt from city, city streets and squares. I, I think that's the delineation. I don't know squares are parkland, but I'm saying there's, there's the outer belt and there's where, you know, there's the garden bed at the front of someone's yard. 
I just think they're a little bit different. So I want to understand where we put our resources. Um, yeah, so obviously um, resourcing across all those spaces is run through um, Clinton, through the, through the depot. Obviously, the streetscape team is slightly different maybe to a horticulture team that looks after certain parts of the parklands, which would be slightly different to verges, which um, or outside of the, um, a, a residential house where there might be a verge. There's a, a mixed economy around how those spaces are cared for. Some residents do it themselves. Um, and I think on occasion we've picked that up over the years as well. So there's um, the, the teams that Clinton has um, operate across the whole city. Um, in terms of what we were trying to provide tonight was um, a, a, a cut of the services or operating budgets that community members will understand. They don't necessarily differentiate across each of the different um, uh, activities that that we would um, call. So that's what we're trying to do is aggregate anything to do with parklands and open space together um, and then show um, what uh, resources are associated with that. Sorry, Grace, did you wish to add something? Uh, only further, thank you. Only further to add that the service directory provides details the definition of what parklands is and it does exclude street specs and movies. It does even look at why our open space yep. so the service directory, which these service costs in the um, business plan budget refer directly to that just to yes. sort of make sure that we retain the consistency between what we define as a pipeline. Right, I'll, I'll, I'll refer back to that. Great for the future of current uh, years, uh, stuff that's split, split into parklands and open space. Ah, so it gives you yeah. there, hasn't, hasn't got roads, but it, it, it gives you the groupings of what we're spending. Yeah. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, just some other, some other questions, Chair. Uh, the, um, when we come to uh, parking, uh, and I'm thinking about capital projects, uh, renewal and replacements of assets, 2.8 mil. Um, I'm assuming the majority of that is for uh, uh, renewal works on, on the UPARCs that we're contractually obliged to do. Is that correct? Oh, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking at parking on 427 of the agenda or 36 on the business plan and budget. And, and, and just for context, I'm, I'm thinking back to our previous budget where we approved, I want to say 800,000 in order to replace some of the boom gate and associated machinery that regulates that. And rather excitingly, we were going to put, we were going to put number plate scanners in and I haven't seen any of them eventually. I don't go to each of our car parks, so some of them may have gone in. Uh, which day do we refer to? It's 427 on the agenda. I'm happy to answer. Um, and now I've been referred to Tom for some detail. Um, thank you for the question through the chair. Uh, the, the renewal does refer to the boom gate system, the ticketing machines. Um, it's sort of the entire gamut, which does include your uh, license plate recognition um, across uh, initially all the two car parks, but the whole, that value does go off the, the nine car parks can just be installed over stages, but Tom can talk more about the delivery of them. Tom? The your presiding member, that's indeed correct. It will include validated parking and uh, number plate recognition. The issue has been this year, uh, there was a total of 660,000, however, because of the all the equipment that we would require, most of the manufacturers are in Europe. Um, we've had to move that into the 20, 21-22 reallocate, but the, the sum that's actually uh, prescribed there actually allows us to deliver more car parks. So we're going to be doing all of them? Or it it of would them leave, through your side member, it would leave just probably about two car parks to finish off and deliver. And through you, Chair, are we, are we picking which car parks are, well, I suppose, the, the ugly cousins to the U Park Empire? Are they the ones that will come last? The least profitable car parks? Tom? Three presiding member. One is uh, we're looking at where the the most profitable car parks are, which would benefit for that technology. But the other one is we look at the life life cycle of the asset, which is due for replacement, and we actually just identify the car parks that way. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Fantastic. Okay, uh, that's... Can I take it to other uh, councillors? No, I'm, I'm still going. Sorry, Chair. Well, can um, we uh, take it to other questions and come back to you, Councillor Hyde? Uh, sorry. You're welcome to. People Thank have you. Relevant questions. Yeah. Any other uh, questions of councillors? Well, I have well. Oh, okay, Councillor Mike, I'll give you some leeway here. Always relevant. As long as we stick to the but, um, item. At 21. Um, it said the audit committee provided advice to council at 21.1, 21.2, and 21.3. Um, can we have that advice? Um, it is, according to that passage, related to the budget, and yet it's not being provided to us. It would be really helpful if that could be provided to elected members. Grace, is that um, something that can be done? Uh, thank you. The 21.1234 and 5 were the recommendations provided by the committee. So that, that section 21 is actually the audit committee's feedback. Uh, but clearly the information that goes with that is important to us. Uh, and if we could have that information, it would be useful. Um, it is related to the budget. Um, thanks, Councillor, through the Chair. Uh, the minutes will be provided through from the audit committee will be provided to Council in the next Council meeting anyway. Uh, yeah. Sure, I'm asking for more than uh, the minutes, thank you. Uh, uh, the minutes will simply say um, it was proposed by, seconded by, agreed. I'm asking for the information that underpins that, that is uh, of such importance that it is referred to as being something we should understand at 21.1, 21.2 and 21.3. Thank you, Councillor. I'll, I'll just um, clarify the item that was taken to the audit committee on the 19th of March was the same presentation that was presented to this council on the 9th of March. It was the, the, um, the basically the draft budget position as it stood at that point in time. Yep. Um, so it was exactly the same presentation that the council received in the workshop provided to the audit committee um, on the 19th of March. Okay, I, I understand that, but what they're asking for us to do is, is considering valuations in terms of rates. What, the, what does that mean? Do they want us to consider increasing rates? Do they want us to consider holding them where they are? If they want them increased, what are they proposing? They're asking for us to continue to review services and identify opportunities for further operating budget expenditure through contestability. I'd like to know a bit more about that. We've not had any presentation on that. Um, it's asked us to review our work plan as well in terms of renewals, uh, carry forwards. I understand that. Um, and condition ratings, I would like to understand a bit more about that because I think that's fairly important. I've heard it referred to briefly. Um, and if there is something that sits behind their recommendation to grow revenue streams, other than a desire to see us growing revenue streams, that would be really useful. If they're saying we should, and I'm just plucking things out of the air, we should be opening corner stores selling Coca-Cola, well, it would be good to know that. That's all I'm asking. Sia, did you want to know? Um, thank you. The, um, the recommendation that, that was um, prepared by the audit committee. Um, it was a really good discussion. Um, I know that the independent members have offered to come and um, talk to council um, and we have enabled that to happen in the past um, but I'm happy offline to run you through the, the overview of the, the, the discussion with Councillor Martin um, that we had with the audit committee. It was a long discussion with um, lots of input, certain ideas, lots of ideas that aren't captured were also um, mooted and discussed. So, um, well, look, I'm, I'm happy to have that offline. Um, if, if you think, however, it would be a benefit to all of us, um, then I'm happy for that to include others. Uh, through the presiding member, the, the, the challenge is that um, council entrusts um, to the audit committee certain roles and responsibilities. So, um, I guess what I'm mindful of is not duplicating um, audit committee discussions at committee discussions and then at council as well. Uh, so just a matter of process and governance. Um, and, and look, this is a serious question, although my, um, uh, my guess is that the people on the other side of the room might um, object to it. Um, we say in terms of the public uh, documents at 482 that our budget is based on the principle that the current generation are able to pay their way by funding the services and infrastructure they utilise. 
and yet we're proposing a deficit of 200 plus million in 10 years, uh, unless we sell the assets that we're proposing to sell, um, which is another issue. Um, uh, is that, I mean, what is the definition of paying their way if indeed in 10 years from now, our debt will be the highest level uh, it's been at and about 85% of what is our uh, rates revenue at that time? Thanks, Councillor. Through the Chair, um, the definition of paying their way would be to um, try and aim for surpluses in more years than less and to maintain a debt borrowing level or borrowing level, which is the 200 million that you're referring to, um, uh, in a, I guess, a sustainable fashion. It doesn't mean that that's going to be paid off in 10 years or down in 10 years. So I don't think um, anyone will take out debt and expect to it to be paid in such a short term arrangement unless um, there are some kind of aggressive income um, and investments around that one. Um, the idea of spreading across generations means more than 10 years. Um, the generation is 20 to 30 years. Um, I'll kind of remind you about a comment that sort of making early on around sustainability. What you're looking at in 10 years is a sliver, a small sliver of what um, a generation is about and, and what um, a council term and a community is about as, you know, for those of you that have been longer as well and that we've been a council since the early 1800s, so you know. Oh, we got safe ones. So that's the um, that's the the idea behind the long term plan is just to kind of get a a, vis a vision of where we are heading with the decisions that have been made now and what the implications of those decisions are going to be for the next ten years. Um, it won't suggest that um, generations aren't able to pay um, just because the deficit levels lift, um, though it is um, pertinent that we actually manage those deficit levels and it is extremely important that we look at what our um, surpluses are because that's our main trigger to make sure that we are not generating years and years of deficits and in more in more years than most um, and actually burdening those future generations by paying back those debts. So it is a balance in it and um, a bit of a, an art of to, as to how we look at those decisions now and make sure that those are funded sustainably so that way in the long term we don't um, end up with um, unmanageable levels of debt. The question of whether that value out in that 10 year is unmanageable is a different question as to whether it's, it's too high or, or bad. So. And I, I would like to ask the administration why um, we've not included any uh, context. And look, you know, it's laudable that we're providing such information in terms of individual projects um, uh, and for uh, particular activities. But, there's no way of knowing whether the amount that's allocated is 20% more, 50% less in any previous year. And so therefore, it has absolutely no context. And to be asking people about it um, is, to my mind, one of the shortcomings in the documentation. But I do want to ask why we have not included in setting this up for public consultation some of the key decisions that have been made in terms of rate payers, for example, abandoning the, uh, uh, the rate remission scheme, uh, a percentage that we have done for, God knows how long it's gone now, um, it will no longer apply. And therefore, that's a fairly key element for you know, a significant number of people over a number of years that is, is not referenced in any of the documents at all. And further, uh, I asked the administration why we have not, either in the previous budget or in the current budget, referenced in any way uh, the sale of assets, which is substantial by uh, any definition. The current sale of assets that's factored into this budget um, represents something in the order of close to 20% of our total asset base. That's our commercial no. asset base. Now, our commercial asset base. Talking about information oh, assets. That's, There's $2.2 million dollars in asset sales in there, Chair. No, no, no. Which I'm sure that's Mr. Right. McCready is about I'm to highlight. I'm sure uh, Tom will highlight that. No, no, hang on a minute. I haven't finished. You've allowed him to speak. You've invited the administration there. But yeah, because we need to clarify what you just said there, Councillor. Well, ask him to do it. Well, don't yeah, I don't need you to on. ask. I don't need to ask you. I ask administration to do that, and that's what this forum is here for. This, this so budget, Tom is here this to clarify what you just a said. Long-term financial plan. Thank you, Tom. Did you want to add to that, or do you want to? 
through saying member thank you for the question um, first of all within the long-term financial plan um, without breaching some confidentiality matters it clearly identifies sale down of a uh, particular in number of assets which council endorsed it, it is a, it is not even close to our saleable value in regards to commercial assets as present presented through the strategic property review which highlighted 29 such properties of significant value on councils uh, if council was to sell off and we're not even close to that um, and as presented through the strategic property review we would bring back to council every matter for determination and we're just enacting council's decision based on the, those properties I think uh, in the long-term financial plan, it's actually spread out uh, right up until I believe 23-24, and then we recognise in 24-25 the proceeds from the 88 O'Connell Street, which returns back to us. So uh, council has actually endorsed this um, based on that they're either non-performing or underperforming assets. Chair, um, can I ask then if then the budget presents the long-term financial plan for comment from rate players? speaks to it at length. What is, if $60 million of assets are proposed in the short to medium term as part of the long-term financial plan, what percentage of our total commercial assets, I'm not talking about bridges, footpaths and other items, what percentage does that constitute? Thanks, Grace and Martin through the chair. Um, so there is two separate documents going out for consultation. One is the draft budget, one is the long-term financial plan. Page five of the long-term financial plan gives a whole page of analysis around or um, context in the, around the future fund and the detail behind that mm -hmm. um, and why it was uh, why it was created. Um, because it is a future looking, um, I guess, um, st strategy and, and something that we've been triggered from a financial sustainability perspective. Um, so I think there's enough detail that we've provided in there, keeping in mind the commerciality and confidentiality around some of the items around the strategic property uh, review. Um, so that is, is definitely included um, in the LTFP. Um, to, to the second party question, which I'll just get you just to repeat for me for a second, just to say whether we've captured that properly or not. Yeah, I'm asking why we are not inviting comment from ratepayers about the sale of assets specifically the sale of not only non-performing assets, but performing assets. And we are selling performing assets. No question about that. We have not invited any commentary at all. Um, so thank you, Councillor, through the chair. In the engagement um, uh, pack that will go out, that question is being specifically asked. Um, so the question Sorry, is to the, the community, the engagement um, plan that was approved, that would be include, included in the consultation. Um, there are some key questions in there around you know, um, what the, the community thinks around the key aspects of this, um, of both the plans. Um, so that will, will definitely feature as a, as a key part on there. Um, with regards to the asset value, the asset test um, ratio is something that we do include in the um, LTFP as well, and it is um, obviously in the budget as well. So um, that does give you an indication as to what level of our borrowings is compared to our total saleable assets. So not necessarily just the saleable assets that have been identified through the strategic property review, but those total saleable assets, not where it's not stormwater, etc. Um, and that is still within the council approved limit of a maximum of 50%, which is now sitting at 29 for the, for the future year as well. So there is a, a liquidity test that we do there as well to make sure that we can actually fund the borrowings. Sure. I, I'm still policy. asking though, Chair, please correct me. What is the percentage of assets that we are selling as a percentage of our total commercial assets? Happy, happy to be correct. John? The presiding member, out of the 29 assets which we actually shortlisted, the 29, there's considerably more assets, saleable assets, not commercial, but out of the 29, we're talking about somewhere around 7%. 7%. 7 of the ones identified, if you looked at the totality, that figure would come, come down considerably. It's commercial assets. Uh, non-performing, underperforming assets. Uh, they're not all commercial. Some of some of them could be land holdings without uh, development. Some of them could be facilities where we're selling, but we're getting upgraded facilities coming back. Um, but the reality is, uh, if you're looking at it based on the assets that we're selling down off the 29, it's seven percent. 
Okay, so, Councillor Martin, I'm going to just move on and we can come back if you like. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yes, we can answer that one. Sorry. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Sorry. Um, the rating, um, the remission comment that you made, that is in the rating policy, which is actually out for consultation as we speak. Um, and um, so that part is going through its engagement process. So that's why now. That is in that document, and we ask people specifically what they think about that. In the rating policy, that yes, that item is in that rating policy. And also uh, uh, the um, um, the scheme whereby seniors. Uh, yes, that's so mentioned the as four, well. The four elements of change in the rating policy um, around the seniors removal, the special special discretionary rebate uplift, the rebate, and for the vacant land differential rate. Those are the four key areas that changed in the rating policy, and they're all out. Okay, well, Chair, yeah, I, I am delighted to hear that the cuts are being explained, um, but in another document. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hyde. Uh, thank you. I'll just resume my previous line of question, then, Chair. Um, uh, in, turning to page 428, where we're detailing our planning, uh, building, and heritage uh, expenditure. Um, under operating activities, there is something called Built Heritage Management Grants. Is that the Heritage Incentive Scheme by another name? Uh, thank you, Councillor, through the chair. Yes, it is. It is. Okay. Is, it, is there any reason for the name change? Or people? We tell people to put a sign up saying Heritage Incentive Scheme and then we shoot our promotion in the foot by changing the name of it. Any reason why we changed the name? Anyone can answer that? Councillor Hyde? Did it come through as part of that heritage strategy piece of work, maybe? What's the change? They've changed it to heritage management grants. It's still a heritage incentive. We've just got them for understand heritage Okay, we can rename it, but I've got a feeling it came through a workshop on the heritage management stuff a while ago. But that's okay, we can change that. I think that's right. We don't have to identify it, so why should we change it? And plus, we have to reuse our signs. That, that, you know, they make the wrong things. So it'd be silly to do that. Yeah, we can, we can do you have other questions, Councillor? Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, so uh, it's very funny yeah. to scroll through, but um, probably the next thing the next thing in my sites was actually regarding this building, and I note that there was $2 million um, of work on the facade of Town Hall that was, well, is proposed in this document. Um, now, I, I appreciate that may be part of the asset management plan for this building, but I, I would just note that having councillors' offices painted and recarpeted would have also been part of the asset management plan of this building, and that didn't really need to occur. So I want to understand a little bit more of that $2 million expenditure. Is, is there anything that is going to substantially degrade or get worse if we push that into next financial year while we recover our position? Clinton? Um, sorry, can I just comment first on the, on the, on the interior work? So there was a, a civic, an internal civic plan that was undertaken at the request of council, and that work was prioritised um, over the last few years, which you know picked up things like the Queen Adelaide room, mm -hmm. the hallways, the rearranging of a lot of the civic items. Um, so that work was done in accordance with um, Andrew, oh, I've just remembered his name, Andrew Clanky, which you will remember him, um, those of you that were involved in that work. Um, I beg your pardon? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Oh, okay. I didn't catch that. Um, but I, uh, in terms of the external works, um, Clinton's better place to explain what's going on. Thank you, Clinton. Through the chair, thanks, CEO. Um, so you're right, the, that work has been. Um, uh, on our asset renewal plans for a period of time. Um, we have actually deferred um, the work for as long as possible, but there are some critical works to the facade of the town hall that need to be undertaken. So therefore we've included it um, in, in the program of works. But of course that is um, subject to council approval of the final budget. Yes, yeah, so, sorry Chair, there's just there's no detail around it. Or, I just want to get a bit of an understanding on what, what $2 million on a, a 
on, the, on this building will will get us. Are there, are there is you know sometimes sometimes it makes sense to go in and do more work because you're already there doing work. But um, uh, you know, is it the case that you only need to spend four hundred thousand dollars to stop this thing falling down? And just because we're doing that, we're going to spend two mil doing the whole lot. I just needed a little bit more clarity before I asked the community to pay two million dollars to take care of the building that we use. Uh, through the chair, so the the details are uh, contained within a report that I that I have in terms of the need for the facade works, um, things like um, repointing, re-rendering, um, fixing any um, issues or surface cracks that might be apparent on the on the facade. So um, I'm, I'm happy to provide more details um, That's through to you. That would help. Yeah, that would be fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I'm just wondering, I'm just wondering as well um, um, regarding the budget. T two things. The first question is, if I said through you, Chair, that I want a break-even budget, what would the administration then go and do? Kill themselves. <laughs> <laughs> oh, come on. Hey, is this a question for you, Theo, or you, Justin, or Grace? Um, I can I can kick it off. I'm sure Grace will be more <laughs> capable of filling out the, the gap. So, um, as, as we have said for a period of time now, um, that there are limited levers in terms of how we're able to uh, break even, whether it's on the revenue side or the expenditure side. So, Grace, if you just want to walk members through those, that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, through the chair. Um, so, I guess the the um, 20 million savings that we've already put through has come predominantly from the cost side. Um, there is a, a, a big question as to whether there was a, an additional savings target imposed. It would be just that, it would be an imposition, it would be something that we wouldn't have a plan for. Um, it would be something that we'd be aiming for and hoping to achieve. Um, and as, um, as I've mentioned around the decision making, what we're looking for is here long term sustainable decision making when it comes to those sorts of decisions. Um, and we're yet to see the full ramifications of the $20 million um, uh, reshape uh, as it stands right now and how that's going to sort of fully play out given that it's only sort of been live for not even three months. Um, and then uh, if we were to look at an additional savings target, or, an, or a budget kind of um, break even budget, no matter how we get there, um, we want to make sure that that's done in, I guess, yeah, those long term sort of sustainable decisions. Um, not convinced that we can uh, generate a, 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 I guess, a, a, a target that is substantiated with anything at this point in time. So if we were looking at a break-even budget, it would have to be the subject of a council decision and something that we'd be able to obviously try to work towards um, during the year. Um, and it would therefore be the recommendation as well that when we are looking for budget repair kind of items like that, that we're clear around whether they are income-based, expense-based, um, long-term or short-term, um, because as we know, we can kind of experience windfall gains and losses throughout the year based on any reason at all. Um, and what we are, again, looking for here is a longer-term solution, not a, a short-term sort of um, plug fix, which is, I guess, the, the, basic, the basis of the original um, 5.2 that was put in there. So um, if it was something to be put in there, I'd strongly recommend that there's some substance, substance behind um, that number and how it would be formulated rather than just generating a number to break, break even. Can, can I just add, add to that too? Um, there is a commitment there at uh, point number five in terms of our recommendation to bring you back um, further opportunities that we identify. So we know it's not game over, but we didn't want a, as Grace has just pointed out, we didn't want a fictitious amount uh, where there's no substance behind that. Um, the budget repair would be not just savings, but hopefully the, the income, as has been said. We still haven't presented to you the contestability review, which uh, uh, Councillor Martin was talking about before. We, we have put that deliberately through the audit committee, so that will front there and then come to council. Uh, we believe that it needed that extra scrutiny uh, in terms of what's there, but largely the, the top item is going to be dealing with the aquatic centre. Uh, and the other opportunities are the um, uh, car park and income. Um, some of the stuff that we're looking at where we're going to bring that back 
is going to take some time to to uh, look at. Um, so certainly, some more line by line reviews. We believe we can get some uh, some more out of that over time. Um, some of the ways we do our asset management too, in terms of purchases and sales and disposal of uh, things into the fund, uh, it is really important. And also some educational stuff that we're going to be doing around uh, project management. And we've talked about the whole of life cost in terms of the way we present multi-year projects. So there's a range of things that we can do, but they're not short term. We've taken the easy stuff basically, and that's what's been presented in that 20 mil. Um, so uh, in terms of savings, lowest hanging. Yeah, like some of it not so low, fruit, but and, and, and also some deep dives, but not across the, across the board in terms of restructuring people and putting them into new jobs has, has been difficult in terms of their uh, coping with that and gathering the skills and the knowledge of who used to do what. So there's still some re-education of the, the groups to, to be done. We're trying to do that because they've got new budgets, they've got new people in there, they, they're not sure exactly who's accountable for what. Uh, across the board, so some of that is a bit longer term from a cultural perspective. Yeah, I, I, I suppose, Chair, um, when when I was discussing when he was here, Mr. Goldstone um, suggested that there would be further opportunities for operational savings on the horizon, and suggested that there may be a workshop that could happen within the first quarter um, of this year. I understand. Um, our financial controller has advised that there wasn't much science behind the 5.2 and that's part of the reason why we took it out but uh, I'm wondering if there is any if there is any understanding in the administration as to what perhaps you know what items would Mr Goldstone have been bringing to that workshop um, I know there was the there was the community you know, grants part of it, but was was it, he specifically said to me that um, we're now at the point where there are perhaps programs that you maybe want to discontinue, and there was perhaps a short list there. Is there is that is that in existence, and, and could it come to us? Yeah. Uh, thank you through the chair. Um, so the executive got together in January just before uh, uh, Mark. Um, took sick leave. We spent a day talking about um, different ways in which um, we could um, find further savings. Um, I think I think it's fair to say that at this point we really are um, looking at service cuts. To, uh, you know, I think it's um, while the structure is now landed and we're working through what that. Um, working through the impact it's having around service levels. I do think um, that there's probably time for conversation with council around some of those activities or projects or programs that we have been doing for ever and ever and ever. I think one of the observations I would make after um, the, um, sorry, over 19 years here is that um, each, each year or each term of council, a new idea comes on board and as an organisation, we continue to do that. Um, and so there's certainly opportunity through reviewing. Uh, the work that Matt Humes is leading around contestability may not necessarily yield um, contestable outcomes, but we certainly do think, although it take, it's a slow process, we do think there are opportunities through that to find um, more permanent savings. Um, yeah, so I, I'm not aware of a, of a list that Mark had developed, but certainly as an executive we had um, come together to start to work through um, organisationally uh, what else was there uh, that, that could be uh, delivered um, as part of permanent savings. And I should just add that over the last few years as well, let's not forget the 12 million in organisational savings that were delivered through um, two other restructures that Mark that Mark did. Um, that's going from five GMs to four GMs to three GMs to two directors. So there has been um, ongoing cuts um, and um, readjustments through the organisational structure that delivered around 12 million savings as well. Um, thank you. And I suppose that covers off the operational side. On the borrowing side, um, through you, Chair, uh, I think it's 99.1 is what this budget is um, predicated on. Um, I just have a feeling that that was the same as at the 23rd of March, where we resolved not to continue with the East-West Bikeway, and noting that that funding deed has now expired. So 
Has, has that $2.8 million been taken out? I know that was funded through borrowers. Why hasn't that $2.8 million been taken? It's in the papers. I was yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Councillor, through the chair. No, it hasn't been taken out under um, the um, predication that we haven't heard back from the state government as yet um, as to whether we can reallocate the funding and whether if we do reallocate the funding, whether it will still be matched funding. So at this point, for the purposes of the draft budget and where it is in the process, um, it was decided we'd better we'd leave it in and once we had more information around what we were to do with that money, whether we had to return it, keep it, reallocate it, etc., that we would have more yeah. information by the time this budget would go sort of into its final phase for um, adoption and we'd be able to update the final budget or whatever that is. So the government's already announced that it's going to build a cycling bridge somewhere with the money. I read about it in the advertiser, so it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. as, as well, if I can just ask through you, Chair, a little bit more about, um, look, I'm of a different mindset there, but I'll save that for next week. Um, uh, a little bit more about the borrowings. Um, if, if, if we suggested as part of this budget that asset enhancements, uh, disregarding strategic property investments, that asset enhancements should be funded only through surplus budgets. Um, uh, it, it seems to me, and there isn't a particular breakdown of the $22 million, just under $22 million in borrowings, but 14 million of that, 14 odd million, I'm assuming is Central Market Arcade. Um, some of that is also the bikeways. Some of that is also the market to Riverbank. And some of that is also Moonta Street. Am I correct in saying that that's the balance of that 22 million? Uh, thanks, Councillor, through the chair. Uh, yes, so in the appendices of um, the uh, budget, business plan and budget, mm -hmm. those um, major projects and uh, new and up, uh, new and significant upgrades do add up to that balance. Right. And so, if we adopted a position that asset enhancements, um, uh, which are the things you like but don't necessarily need, if we adopted the approach that asset enhancements um, should be funded through surplus budgets, um, we would basically be scrapping all those projects bar the Central Market Arcade, which is a strategic property investment. Why would you do I probably just have to look at whether we track really obliged to any of those things um, as to whether we could um, legally kind of not proceed with them or delay them, etc. And there's those that um, do have grant funding attached to them that therefore there's an obligation to fulfill them those grant funding. Um, and I'd probably need some definition around what a surplus means in terms of are we talking about surplus cash flow from operations or are we talking about surplus bottom line surplus? Um, the um, cash flow from operations because we have cut our renewal spend this year is technically in surplus and funding these additional amounts. Um, so uh, we would need to define if you're going to put that in as a part of the recommendation of the change, etc. We need to define exactly what that means to whether we would be where we have those services, what that service would actually mean, whether it's cash services or profit services. Um, but yeah, we would have to kind of go through some of those. I think in the presentation on the 23rd of March in the workshop, we did highlight only three of the projects that we thought didn't have either a council resolution attached to an obligation or a contractual obligation that we thought we could remove and that did um, only equate to about a million dollars worth of funding in those new and significant upgrades. Yeah. Um, all infrastructure things that came from outside the infrastructure portfolio, mind you, which is not the wording of the question. But um, uh, <coughs> as well, I'm, I'm just curious, Chair, um, is I wanted to understand the relationship. Obviously, there's a lot of carry forwards, or a lot of projects that will be the subject of carry forwards listed in this document. Um, we will only have clarity on those, well, final clarity, I think, what is it next month? Is that correct? Or the month after that? Basically, your Q4 carry forwards, your final close out for the year. Uh, the current standing process for this council is to adopt them through QF3, um, which will be due to come to you, yes, in the coming um, yep, next month, so in May. Um, so we will be bringing uh, 
I guess the traditional process to bring that that process through to you in that mechanism. I have been discussing a change in that process with um, Justin recently, and um, we propose something slightly different um, for next year. Um, but I would like to sort of bring that through to council first, um, as with council's comfortable with that that decision. Alternatively, yeah, we can stick to the normal um, process and ensure that those carry forwards are estimated in the Q F three report you may. I, I suppose my, my just, observation. No, I, sorry, if, Councillor Hyde, I'm just letting you know that we've been on this um, matter for 50 minutes. It's so a $300 million budget. I so understand that, like Councillor Hyde, understand but that. I would like to uh, just let you know that how long we've been spending on this item. So if you can keep your questions to a minute. I am keeping them to a minute. Um, uh, but thank you. The, uh, I suppose what, what my experience is here is that um, the carry forwards in QF in your last quarter then make your initial your starting position in your in your budget for the year off so you're actually your, your budget is actually off from from day one um is that is am i am i am i correct in in assessing it in that fashion through chat yes yes yeah, so yeah in, in addition to your budget that you're approving you've got the current current boards yeah, yeah, so yeah, but it's, it the, moves the goalposts substantially. That's why there's so much focus um, administratively on addressing carry forwards. I will qualify and say that in this budget, we have accounted for these carry forwards that have been provided in the appendix. So there is approximately $20 million worth of carry forward already included in the draft budget that will go out for consultation. There is a disclaimer in there that says these are subject to council approval through the normal process, but we have included an estimate of the carry forwards in the draft budget number. So if that those carry forwards don't get approved for some reason in the QF3 or they vary um, materially from the 20 odd million that is in there, then that will have a direct impact on the draft budget that's been put out. It will reduce your borrowings, it will reduce the capital works, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is the basis of <laughs> actually why I wanted to sort of propose a change to the um, process in terms of um, approving them through the QF3 in May is because um, right now what we're putting forward to you around is a estimate of the carry forwards based on our knowledge of where the projects stand today and how much and what we think we can deliver by the 30th of June. The reality of it is, is that that process, it doesn't change for the May, the QF process is still an estimate based on what we think we're going to deliver on the 30th of June. What I'd like to do is build some more assurity around that process and actually, therefore, when you know when you're approving the carry forwards, you're approving the actual carry forwards based on spend. It means we have to play with the timing a little bit. However, what has been included in the draft budget at this point in time is definitely the estimate of carry forwards as we see them at this point in time. So there is already a number in place for that. And if I just made this last point, Chair, is that, that 20 million, is that is that all infrastructure related to carry forward? Or is, is that including some other projects? Uh, thanks through the Chair. Um, it's it's basically all of our capital carry forwards for new and significant upgrades. Um, so it does include some things that are not necessarily around infrastructure, such as the Southwest Community Centre. Um, or it, yeah, it definitely does have some other stuff that are um, infrastructure based so it is any of the capital carry forwards that we have identified right and and how does that how does that quantum compare to the actual budget that was approved this time last year uh, thank you council i think i understand your question i'm not quite sure what the carryover budget number was um last year you mean kind of coming into this financial year is that what you're yeah yeah so, sorry sorry I mean, yeah yeah, yeah. Um, I'd have to take that on notice and, and provide that in further detail um, to see what the actual carryover budget was last year. Remembering, just remembering, remembering Councillor, um, with COVID, our budget um, was really only um, endorsed, I think it was uh, early August, July, August, um, and we had to recut quite quickly. Um, a lot of the capital projects and we timed them um, due to you know, inability of contractors and our ability to actually get projects um, delivered on the ground. It's been a historical problem though, hasn't it? Lord Mayor, would you want to add something? Um, yes, I, I think it, we've, the, we've started this discussion before and it's one of the discussions that we were having at Audit as well is in terms of if there's a quantum 
but 20 million or more that's a carry forward every year, then that goes to capacity to be able to deliver. And so if there's 20 million here, that's obviously timing of work, which means they're going to be delivered in the first quarter or the first two quarters, then is there an ability for us to look at what has been budgeted for deliver, delivery in those quarters, which will then move forward because they won't be able to deliver because of our capacity to deliver. And therefore, it's a matter of, um, you know, if we're going to get to a budget where we're not doing carry forwards, which I believe has happened in the past, um, by doing rolling three-year uh, three year budgets, and uh, I know that's the work that you and Clinton are doing now, then is there the ability for us to do that in this budget so that there would be less in the next budget given we're all carrying forward 21 million to be delivered? Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor, through the Chair. Um, there has been a bit of work looking at these continuing projects around whether they are, again, midway through delivery um, and therefore whether they are practical to actually be not carry forward. Um, Again, the list is quite small when you kind of start looking at those ones that haven't been started yet or aren't in that process. I guess the best one, probably the most um, significant in terms of value of those carry forwards of the 20 million is $6 million of the East West Bikeway still in there. So um, there's a legitimate reason as to why that's still in there. Um, though it hasn't started, do we carry it forward? Um, um, then, you know, that would be sort of, uh, I guess, an easy one um, that we could justify whether we carry that forward or not. And, um, but there is, there is a few material ones in there that uh, generally haven't been started and can't be carried forward um, in, that, in that list of that process. They all are in some way, shape or form underway. And, and I'm not actually suggesting that if that work has commenced and that's uh, that work that you were doing around showing, you know, the budget this year, next year and whatever in terms of the life of the project, um, what I'm talking about is obviously they still have to be delivered and they would most likely be delivered in the first two quarters of the next financial year. So therefore, can we look at what is budgeted for the first two quarters of the next year and move that forward? Therefore, we don't have to put a carry forward in the following financial year. Mm -hmm. so, so, which is really just getting back to um, us uh, budgeting to our capacity to deliver. Catch up. Uh, thank you. The, the comment I'll, I'll add to that is, um, I think you're absolutely right. I think carry for is symptomatic of an earlier issue, um, and to use um, Claire's words before with regards to the whole procurement issue as well, is um, fixing carry forwards with kind of either delaying or, or restarting is, is not the root cause of the issue. The root cause of the issue is how well we kind of plan these things up front, and that's why a lot of our focus is around now how we actually are creating the planning process or more work in that planning cycle so that way we're not asking for the money when we're not ready for the money, um, and, and we're not we're making sure that we do have the capacity to be able to deliver them. Um, so that work is something that we, we've identified and said, well, we need to fix that root cause issue. This is what, what I will describe is you're going to experience a transition year um, where we kind of sort of start to flip that around to actually put the focus at the start of the process rather than the end of the process. Care forwards are just symptomatic of an issue that needs to be fixed well and truly. And, and I do want to that. acknowledge that um, the work that Clinton's been doing and particularly taking it through the external audit so that we could actually really unpack the root cause. Um, and I, I know that that's the work that's been done. It would just be uh, good in this uh, financial context if we're not going to be able to deliver, you know, 50, 60 million in the next year, as well as the carry forwards, then we should address it now. If possible. Thank you. And the, the final comment for that would be if we move to a different cycle of approving these carry forward budgets that I've proposed, yes, Council, you have the opportunity to be able to say, once we know what the actual carry forwards will be, where we actually did land at the 30th of June, you'd be able to have the opportunity to say, there is we don't want to continue this work and we want to continue that work um, instead and be able to make that decision knowing exactly where the work is, where it's landed, what the values were, as opposed to where we are right now and still estimating what we think we can do in the next three months. So there is a lot of work happening in the team at the moment as well with the renewals, uh, uh, sorry, with the um, infrastructure team to be able to look at some of the work that we've got going. Can, can we realistically bring it to, to an end by the 30th of June or at least get it started or, you know, how do we actually try and 
push out as much as we can um, within the next three months. Um, there is some resource issues in that space, which I'm you know, sure Clinton can elaborate on, but we're trying as much as we can to try and finalise some of those things. But there is two or three significant ones that we might not be able to move on. I understand this is uh, very important, so uh, any more questions I'll give, even though we've been going on this for an hour, but uh, okay. Councillor Hyde. Um, just well, it's a very important uh, item, so I'm giving everyone the opportunity to actually uh, have a discussion on this. Um, noting that this is the first budget process we're going into, uh, where we have a uh, treasury policy in place that says any sale of assets um, you cannot spend on your operations um, uh, it, it's, it appears to me that there are examples in the past where this council has sold assets and it has just gone into general revenue i understand the winfield dump um uh, 20 million point six dollars and going back a little bit further the sale of um, a car park on grenfell street can the, do the administration have any further information around that and whether those projects were actually tied to any sort of deliverable or investment or or did they did they just go into general revenue? I'm going to give you this question and then we're going to I think we're going to move on because I think we're going into a uh, not a topic. We've had we had no left This is directed to administration. We sold assets and put them into general revenue. We Excuse me, Councillor Moran, Sorry. Councillor Martin, this is a question for administration. You are not administration. Well, actually, so nobody I'm... was here except me. Uh, Claire was. Well, uh, Claire yeah. was here, so yeah, she's yeah. going to answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being so rude. Because you've... You're constantly interrupting. I'm trying to direct things to administration, and I would like to have that ability to do so. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so just quickly through the chair, you remember when we um, last year when COVID hit, um, we spent almost weekly having conversations and briefings with members um, online. Um, one of the sessions um, that we did with you um, was in relation to why things like a future fund um, were so important. Um, and it, and I, I think we gave you about 12, 12 or 15 years worth of data to show um, how council had used the sale of things like the Grenfell Street car park um, and the Wingfield income um, and how there were deliberate choices made by um, different councils long before anyone in this room was um, on, on in the chamber um, around you know using it say for a public realm upgrade and so my my advice was to council was always if you are selling um, assets, you, you should quarantine that income and invest it in something that will generate revenue, which is why the future fund and through the treasury policy became an important element of, of changing the conversation um, and um, you know, having much clearer, much more transparent ways in which um, council could manage its finances. Um, so that was the sort of context for why that future fund was um, so important. And, just and it's always subject to council decisions. So if council does decide that, for example, oh, like five, you know, five million dollars worth of, um, you might get that coming in, and then council decides actually we want to do it. Uh, we want to spend that on um, putting in some enhanced garden beds, you know an entryway into the city or something, then of course that's absolutely council's um, decision to do that. So we're, we're not taking that away from council, but what we're trying to do is just make sure that it was done in a considered, thoughtful, transparent way. Are we just able to get that report that was referred to? Because I don't recall. There was a lot of reports at that time. I yeah, know, yeah, I, so. I can still picture the slides, so I'm sure I'll be able to track it down. There's people nodding, so yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you, everybody. Um, we're going to be moving on, and we're moving on <coughs> to the confidential items. Um, so I'm asking uh, for a seat, a mover and a seconder. A motion to order the exclusion of the public for item 7.7. .7. Yep, right. Oh, sorry, 7.1. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Councillor Pemsaday, second to Councillor Noll. Anybody would like to speak to that? No. Those in favour? Those against? Also doing 7.2, so seek a removal for 7.2. Councillor Pemsaday. Okay. Uh, Councillor Noll. Yep. Those in favour? Those against? Have we lost quorum? No, we're all good. Okay, over here. This is Councillor Martin. May I just say, Councillor Martin, that we are going to 7.2 is a CEO update. So I'll, you don't want to stay for that? I didn't know there was one. Uh, it's an uh, additional CEO update, item 7.2. Sorry.
Get my car or something. Uh, we, we did, yeah, we did one. Let me see uh, she just has a closing meeting. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.